On on YouTube, you mean? Hi, good morning, class. Good nice morning, Timo. I'm checking now the YouTube link to see if there's sound.
have. And hopefully we will get some questions by the end. So I will just turn it to you.
Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the conference committee uh, of Blurring the Lines and this conference, we are thrilled to welcome you all to the first day of the second international conference on photography and education. Uh, this initiative started last year in collaboration with Blurring the Lines, a platform for fostering talent and networking in digital culture that receives the precious support of Good Paris morning, College everyone. of Art, Urbanautica Institute. Good morning, everyone. the conference I'm committee uh, of Blurring and the Lines host and this European Cultural Center. We are thrilled to welcome you to welcome all to the first day uh, of the second we'll international host five conference final discussion of discussion in education. education. And finalists uh, of the 2020 this edition of Blurring the Lines. It is an honor for me as a platform for fostering talent and networking in digital culture that receives the precious support of Paris College of Art, Urbanautica Institute. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to welcome the panelists and the curators this time at Hathen and the host in this conference of Blurring the Lines. To welcome you. The rational uh, uh, today, uh, I today to the today's discussion on our culture, our willingness to foster and promote uh, an open debate in digital culture, and access to education and professional opportunities for the younger generation. Uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, we hope to contribute to the discussion in space, especially in the program that we have to also the panelists in the online and online support, and set configurations with the proposed The rational I hope you will enjoy the discussion on the first and most correct with a group of panelists by asking questions to the YouTube channel, the National Education Channel. Congratulations, congratulations again to all of the, the winners in China. Thank you. We hope to continue to the discussion. Good morning. We welcome the second uh, edition of the International Conference uh, during the Lines, which focuses on uh, photography and education. I'm Steve Bisson, and I'll be the moderator of this morning's first panel. Um, with me, uh, we have a group of recent graduates Good of morning. 2020, uh, uh, namely thinking because the Shemash Prime National Conference studied at the Marine Alliance which focuses on the graduate program regarding the Kenna Yago and Mr. Bisson, and I'll be the moderator of the college special for the and uh, with me, uh, from uh, uh, we have a group of graduate. recent graduates of our conference in the Netherlands. Uh, Alexandra Maldonado, who is a Shemash Prime Veronica Kandarlovska, and finally,
my experience to have like my work a lot with new social media that can a lot of people to connect with another people in another country or like to make the distance that we really short. But we don't have to forget about these other people that are not connected or so they are not alone to connect for us and make how are the opportunities for them. Uh, we still have to to to be in touch with like uh, not social media connections. We still uh, have to in that we have to uh, have to forget about the go for this quick thing or so I think we have to have an equilibrium for me uh, for example social media a website and that works perfect but uh, it takes a lot of time to put it a lot of money to put it uh, like working but what if I don't have that money? What if I don't have that time or that uh, knowledge to put it like work on? So I think we have to be like more conscious about the opportunities that all the world have to connect and to to be in touch with another people, uh, photographers and that. So I think it's important to still looking at these like physical supports and not only going right into the online uh, there's a lot of uh, people that are like, I don't know, they just need that this opportunity to to show their talents or or whatever here. So in my experience, I think like we have still have to this equilibrium to not let and others like outside of it. Clear, clear, clear. Um, anyone else want to share about their experience? with this type of te uh, impact of the technologies within their practice. I can share something. Um, well, I think it's a, the online channels can be really good to show your uh, work to the world, but at the same time, I doubt the effect of your visibility because it's some kind of a way to promote your work and um, to just be out there. But for me, sometimes it feels more like some kind of a digital CV or newsletter like uh, Instagram, you're just posting stuff and creating uh, a kind of um, f uh, digital identity. And I think this it can be a good thing if you create this good identity and you show your content to the world. But at the same time, I think the, the main goal in your work should be this uh, or can be this physical form in which you can present uh, your photography. So for me, um, the online channels feel more like a way of promoting your work and yourself as a as an artist. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's it. Uh, it's interesting what you just said, Dan, because it feels like um, there's a threat behind the use of these technologies, right? Um, and the fact that, as Alexandra said, it might be very time consuming, but they also they might take away uh, your attention from yourself or from your uh, career, from your artwork, your production, your creativity, while you are trying to keep it up with the, the image of yourself as a professional, as an artist that you're trying to build. So finding this equilibrium, I guess it's not, it's not that easy. And I'm not sure maybe if um, we could expand the, the question regarding as you just graduated basically uh, recently, how uh, in your experience within schools you um, have deal with this type of issue um, is was this part of the curriculum somehow uh, trying to understand which type of scenario we are dealing with or not what was your experience with this specific regard in my, in my school there was not really much of a focus on uh, how to be an artist after art school um, there was some kind of things about how you can really uh, navigate yourself into the, the digital world and into the, the the big world of being an artist. But most of the time it was not really much of a topic. So I think this this should be a topic to um, really prepare, prepare yourself for the world after art school, because now uh, when I graduated, 
it actually is starting to I'm starting to learn how it works and how it can work. So um, maybe to just start doing this uh, earlier uh, within art school, it can be uh, really interesting, I think. Thank you. Uh, what about the others? Like, uh, Mohammed, you, you have uh, graduated from um, a school in Singapore. Uh, so I'm very curious about your experience with this regard. Um, learning from an area uh, that we, we do not often uh, hear a lot. So I think your, your experience is truly interesting. Right. Um, I think as a creative in, um, in Asia, especially for me, I think like with the whole um, like COVID situation, I think that being a creative or being a fresh graduate in Singapore has um, to use social media as a platform has, became, has become increasingly vital. Um, it's something that you could not um, or avoid using 10 years ago, but right now it's really important to, um, to, to be and to actually um, like showcase your work through social media. Um, because I think um, that one should not um, overlook the power and the outreach that social media has. I think when you really curate and when you really um, put a lot of attention to what you post or what you like put on your your feet, um, I think that it could garner you some really exciting opportunities. Like for me this year, I think um, ever since the day I graduated, I think I have been working um, on creating imagery um, ever since, ever since probably like May. Um, I also feel that as a fresh graduate, it's also quite important for you to understand that, um, to understand the whole, to understand social media in a, in a more, educational way, um, um, it's not something that happens by chance. I think that everything that you post or everything that you put out there is being taught through. Um, also, I think that um, it has to come with a certain background um, work that you put every time you post something on Instagram. Yeah, so. Yeah, so it's, we need to raise our own somehow awareness about what you're doing with, um, because it has some potentially it's powerful and it allows us to reach a very wide audience and scale at the same time as you say uh, it feels like there are some um, pitfalls some risk in not using consciously these channels um, and this and the point is that this might affect also our image as a, as a professional so but let me go back to what also Alexandra has said about, she was talking um, slightly about the issue of privilege, right? That, of course, we are talking about technologies, but not often these technologies are available for everybody. And, and this plays a difference in our globalized world, which has inside huge polarized situations in terms of local politics, in terms of uh, gender, race issues, especially privilege, as Alexandra has just mentioned. So, uh, Thimbin Kazi, uh, I would like to get you involved in this, with this uh, regard as you uh, live in a country, uh, South Africa, um, uh, and you have studied at a um, market photo workshop in, um, in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. I think your experience is a bit different from traditional academy, right? Uh, so, how have you experienced uh, the use of these technologies um, uh, in your in your experience and, and showing up your work to, to a global audience and reaching you know in interests of curators and and people uh, uh, that are passionate about your work? Okay. Uh, firstly, excuse excuse my background. Um, can can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. So, so for me, I think um, uh, like so these social media platforms become effective in a way that I am uh, like I have an immediate access to kind of like potential clients, um, and uh, and and also an immediate access to kind of build a community, a global community that likes the work, and also a global community that that is into kind of the, the visual building, uh, basically where we can kind of inspire one another and also kind of seek advice from one another. Um, 
but for for me, I think that one of the, I mean, I mean, some of the pitfalls are just how also kind of influential kind of this community or this audience uh, on the social media can be, where kind of, you know, uh, I mean, to a certain extent, um, like Instagram has a kind of a standard appeal uh, or, or can kind of create a standard appeal. Where also, uh, I mean, even in your work, um, perhaps a response to particular images by uh, by people uh, in terms of likes can actually influence uh, your next uh, posting, you know, uh, what you post next. Perhaps uh, subtly so, you know, one can be influenced uh, to, to post more likable stuff. And so, so honesty is taken away from um, these platforms in a way, you know, there's that pleasure of likes at times. Um, and there's that kind of habit of instant gratification that is uh, kind of um, being created in one, you know. Um, I, I don't know, for, for me, I, I think uh, with uh, like personal websites, I, I think I elevate more to personal websites because I feel I can be more myself, more expressive as an artist uh, on a personal website because there's not, there's not an immediate uh, audience, an immediate audience to kind of respond. Um, and also, um, my work is not swallowed up by just the, the, the, the overwhelming um, images on, on, on, on social media. So a visitor takes the time to kind of, you know, visit my site and takes the time to kind of look at the work. Um, and I kind of like that kind of intimacy, you know. Uh, so there's no pressures of, of, of likes there, that, um, I mean, on, on, on a personal side. So, so um, one can almost treat uh, a personal side as, as, as their own studio, in, in, in a sense, as opposed to uh, maybe perhaps platforms like Instagram or Facebook. Uh, so that's my experience, yeah. That's very interesting, this uh, um, argument about the intimacy of the website, you know, and that you brought in the discussion because in the past few years, like uh, we have seen uh, a lot of people uh, shifting, uh, moving into the, the social media and forgetting a little bit about their personal portfolio, personal website, whatever. So why actually you are stating that uh, actually the website is becomes your, you said your almost your studio. I find this idea very interesting. What about the others? How do you, how, what are, how do you relate to the different type of medium that you have? Like Veronica, could you, could you tell a little bit about how you relate to the mediums? Um, yes, uh, I have a website, but I uh, don't use it like uh, a lot. And for me, it's an uh, interesting time to talk about online activity right now, uh, because my activity has changed a lot in the last month, uh, because a lot uh, is happening in Poland now. Uh, there are women's... Uh, strike marches caused by the verdict uh, of the Constitutional Court, which has almost completely prohibited abortion in Poland. Mm -hmm. And uh, protests across the country uh, has have continued since the verdict and uh, it's getting worse. Uh, the protesters were attacked by fascists uh, militians, there's a lot of police brutality. So uh, right now I use Instagram mainly to publish things about protests mm -hmm. and share information from activists. And uh, I start to feel that Instagram it's like really important medium uh, for activism. And uh, it's important to inform people from abroad about what is happening. Uh, so yes, uh, so right now I don't think about self-promotion so much. Mm -hmm. Probably I will like back <laughs> uh, to this, uh, hopefully in the future. But it's not only about like uh, things uh, that happening in Poland, but globally, I think it's uh, like this uh, social media is uh, it's important channel to get information about world issues because it's you know when you can see 
like live streaming uh, from uh, people on the streets, it's easier to get people's attention. So, yeah. So, uh, very clear. Um, this was the second question of our panel, actually. So, you well introduced me. Um, so, technologies, you know, uh, allow us to live in a kind of more globalized world. Huh? This is clear. But at the same time, as I was saying before, there are huge differences. So, uh, my question then was, uh, do local circumstances help us um, to bring more depth in the understanding of our, uh, uh, our global problems? And, and, and it looks like, I mean, your answer is obviously yes. Uh, uh, and I would like to turn this question to, to the others, but also, um, this leads us, I think, and it's a very important issue, to think as an art, as artists, as professionals, as persons, um, shall we use our channels and mix them, uh, mix them up with things much more less related to our um, career, our um, our arts, exact uh, self promotion, as you said, or shall we you know mix it up then with uh, things that uh, relate to global problems or local issues you know and how do we find you know uh, the right mix uh, uh, with this regard how do we choose our battles basically because at some point we know we there are many problems around the globe we all know this every country has its own how do we choose our battles? Um, probably this is the right question then. Maybe Alexandra, you could say something. You were talking about the issue of uh, migrants in Ecuador, right? Before. Yeah. Well, I think, well, I, I am working with migration uh, two years and a half now. So I think it goes like um, by the hand with who are you as a photographer and who are you as an artist? And I think like everything goes around it, no? So um, for example, in my social media, I try to, I think a lot about like posting things. So uh, to keep it like professional because my Instagram was like, at first it was personal, but then through the years it goes like really professional. So I, I always make, um, it's like a plan, you know, it's like to, to do it. And when stories in stories, I try to put it like more personal stuff, but trying to keep the, the main theme in everything. So mm -hmm. is I'm an activist too here. So um, I try always to, to bring what uh, makes, like put value in my work with this too. So I think it all, all of this goes with this personal brand or what are you are, are like building as a, as a photographer and as an artist and as and an activist too. So I think it's like a really important to know first, like who you are, what you want for this too. So for me is uh, my social media is like having a responsibility too, because I have a lot of people that follow me, not only professional, but a lot of the community, the, the migrant community follow me. And for me, it's really important what they see because my responsibility goes right through there, right? So um, so it's, for me, it's really important. I, I see it like, like a, a main thing here, mostly on Instagram. Facebook for me is like more, uh, it depends. It depends a lot. It goes like with the project that I have here with, with the community, but on Instagram, it goes like more in around this like activism, uh, sharing things that I think that are really important that the people can see or that kind of stuff. So I think it's like personal brand and the responsibility that you have like with your work for me, it's that. Thanks, thanks. Uh, anyone want to add anything with this regard or about how social media are helping or can help us to raise awareness around issues that are important for us? and how this uh, interact with the, the fact that we still have to use mediums to promote our works. I think, how, how do you 
you find a balance in between this. I think it's, it's what makes interesting the issue and the question. If you have any uh, ideas about that. And again, and again, I think uh, how, uh, like Dan was saying before that um, this was not a real topic at school, right? Um, what about the other school? Did you in your in your in your um, in your school did you had a chance to ever face this type of issue and think how you would have to react then once you are out of the school? Um, Can I just add, like, um, I think from I think for me, um, I think Instagram has be, has has be, has become like a really mature platform now, um, unlike five years ago. Um, so people usually when Instagram just started, like people are just posting about people just post everything, but right now it has been quite curated. Um, people are taking. Instagram more seriously, and um, like you could, like you could see um, people posting more editorial worthy shots. So that's when you you really know that people are taking this seriously. So for me, as a an image maker, I think it's really you could also look at it in a way where you could identify gaps in in your in the society, or if there's a problem in the society that you could probably use your platform as a way to solve it. So for me, in um, um, through my final year project, I have um, studied how there is a lack of understanding um, towards the youth in Singapore, towards the topic of uh, modest fashion. They they basically like have no um, like background work on the issue. So my response was to create or curate like an exhibition that was a direct response to um, of of modesty in Islam. So. Um, my exhibition touches on um, the different excerpts of verses in Islam that talks about the dress codes in for women uh, back then. So I think that that's one of the ways that you could um, respond to the uh, um, social um, things that happen around you. Yeah. Yeah, and this takes us maybe to a more general question: is how uh, what are the sometimes what might be the risk? for a photographer or for an image maker to raise uh, issues online. Um, I think um, this is something we, we maybe we, we don't think about very much. Um, so, but there are of course risks related, I guess, um, to, to relate to our career uh, as an artist when we do act, um, act as activists instead of artists, right? Even though, you know, the practice may overlap. Uh, I don't know if you have any um, experience with this regard and, or, and let me stand uh, my question. And um, we talk about um, how we can use this medium to, uh, for our purposes, but have you ever had like some negative experience with this uh, medium? Like if you had to give it an advice to other people listening to us, like things that went wrong, basically, um, what type of experience you had in this sense? Well, I mean, for my side, uh, I don't quite have an experience yet. Um, but I, I mean, I've seen, you know, just how, um, uh, especially now, especially uh, perhaps how we, we how, how we were kind of prepared in market photo is around the issues of representation and agency, you know, and so um, just being critical of how a black person uh, or uh, is is represented, um, you know, just uh, referencing the past, you know, are we still kind of doing the same thing, you know? So how is the community? How how are we representing our communities? Um, that sort of vibe. So, uh, so there's been that importance of just taking back the agency, taking back the control of our representation, you know. And so I've seen kind of, kind of, uh, I mean, witnessed um, online kind of, um, uh, I mean, battles of, you know, representation, you know. So, uh, I mean, on my side, I've not quite uh, experienced it yet, but um, uh, I'm more, you know, in this globalized uh, world of images, 
I'm more aware now of just um, um, how uh, I'm supposed uh, like representate the issues of representation. You know, just uh, I'm more aware of that. Um, how the the, the uh, perhaps a community or uh, the black body is represented. Okay, okay, okay. Well, um, I'm uh, I'm very glad of this uh, first panel, honestly, because this is a conference that has a broad topic, which is the relationship between uh, photography, image, and education. And uh, in our perspective, of course, um, uh, often schools um, are not truly aware about the fact uh, the, and the impact of these um, new models, as we said, of diffusing and distributing our work, right? Plays in our career, in our, in our experience. So um, I th you, you pointed out several, um, and you highlighted several uh, issues and pitfalls and opportunities. Uh, and, and I think, this, and I hope, hopefully, uh, as a teacher as well, that this type of debate will will uh, get uh, more space into the curricula. Um, have you ever any other um, uh, experience or advice that you would like to share with our audience with regards to the use of these technologies? Now, we mentioned a lot of things already, you know, about um, uh, uh, negative and positive sides of the use of this media, but anything that you would like to add? Specifically, well, I I think it's it shouldn't be uh, that big of a part of your practice, but it's really a good way to uh, yeah, it should it should be a part of your practice, but you shouldn't focus too much on it because at the end you should focus on uh, creating work and uh, bringing the message out you want to bring out. So I think it's really important to find some kind of balance in um, what you, the way you are working on stuff and the way you promote yourself through the channels. Um, so yeah, that's, I don't know if it's an advice, but um, I think it's a good thing to think about um, while still being at art school or just after graduated. Yeah, I think, uh... Probably it's um, it's a learning by doing process using this technology. So uh, of course school, school should play a role, definitely more in the future. But at the end, it's really up to us to become more and more aware of why we're using and how we should use this medium. And and of course, as uh, Veronica was saying, if at some point uh, uh, you feel that your role as a photographer should be not to self-promote uh, yourself, but maybe taking care of uh, very important issues um, regarding your country, your place, then that's really up to, to you, right, um, Veronica? And it's not an easy decision. How did you face this decision? Uh, um, how do you deal actually with your own personal, instead, motivation and goals? Uh I don't think it's uh, a decision in my case because it just happened and I don't know if it's good or bad. And I think it's also important to uh, go offline some, sometimes because uh, those uh, online activism uh, also can be really overwhelming. And uh, I also need uh, some time offline to focus on work and actually making uh, images, not only posting, so, yeah. Right, right, right, right, yeah. Not, not be uh, overwhelmed by, by the possibility, by the potential. Uh, we all recognize this. Um, so uh, I think we'll, uh, time runs fast and we already came to our conclusion. Um, so I really want to say thank you for um, taking part to this short roundtable. Um, I think when we will, uh, as we are recording, of course, the conference, when we'll edit the proceedings, we will, of course, rethink again about what we, your, you said and 
and there will be a chance again for us to um, interact on the proceedings. Um, I want to say also um, congratulations to you all for being uh, shortlisted and selected uh, at this year uh, 2020 International Call of Blurring the Lines, which gathers together a lot of schools and academies. We try to bring forward and show up new works, new ideas. This year we had a very important topic, it was commitment to urgencies in, in society. So uh, you all, I mean, were selected because your artwork, your um, the, your thesis work as well was uh, found very important and decisive. So uh, my congratulations again to you all. And uh, now uh, we will move in about 20 minutes or so to our second uh, panel with the new moderator. She's Lizanne Verhappen from Photodoc. And we will be talking more about social and environmental awareness. So hope to see you soon again. And thank you all for the audience who's following us and have a beautiful day rest of the day with the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> Hello. Okay, let me just prepare the other panel. So now we're off, so we're not on YouTube. Uh, so Sivai, Sivai is your, your, your, your group, right? Uh, She's here, yes. I'm gonna let her in. So if you wanna, yeah. so, sorry, Steve, are you still here? Yes.
me know when Okay, uh, welcome everyone to this international conference uh, about photography and education in which finalists and winners from the Blowing the Lines program take part. Thank you European Cultural Center, Paris College of Art and Urbanautica for inviting me and organizing this conference. Uh, on behalf of Photodoc, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Lisanne van Happe and I am the head of talent development program at Photodoc. I've been part of the Blurring the Lines jury for the last three years, and it's been a great honor to be part of this talent program. Within this second panel of this conference, we will be talking about photography related to social topics in society. Um, the topic we will be talking about is um, the following. Documentary photography, uh, documentary and social photography occupy an important place in the field. According to you, how can photography address and help social issues? Is photography an excellent tool to raise awareness in terms of ecological and social issues in the world? Can photography shed light on sustainability issues? Why? And in your perspective, what are the ethical application implications of today's photography's practice? Uh, I will be talking about this topic uh, with the following participants. Uh, Ragna Arndt Maric, she graduated at the University of Applied Sciences in Europe in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, Marco Loy uh, graduated from the ESIA, the Instituto Superiore per la Industrie Artistice in Urbino, Italy. Uh, Kincho Bede graduated from the Moholy Nagy Univers University of Art and Design in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, Siva Sai Jivanantam from the National Institute of Design in India. Lisbeth Luft graduated from the Willem de Koning Academy in the Netherlands. Uh, Terna Logo, uh, Terna Jogo, London College of Fashion in the UK. And with Natalia Davtjan uh, from the Elisa, uh, Elisava uh, Academy, the Barcelona School of Design and uh, Engineering in Spain. So welcome everyone. It's good to have you here. Uh, I will be starting off this uh, panel conversation with uh, the perspective of Kincho Bede. She has sent me uh, a text with her point of view on this. So I quote, in my opinion, a photographer has no solutions, only questions. This is true considering photography as well. The only way I can imagine this process is that each and every project comes from a very strong inner impulse, inner conflict. In contradiction to cinematography or literature, photography never formulates solutions. It simply just asks questions and holds a mirror to society. In my understanding, photography has two rules in the present. The first one is that it shows how would people like to see themselves and the world around them. The second is that it confronts us with all the things we have already destroyed. Photography has absolutely no chance to solve world problems with its limited tools, but it's really good for giving us an image of the past, for understanding the present, and gives a chance to us in the present to decide what kind of future we want to build. So thank you, Kincho, for this very, very nice introduction. Um, I think it already gives uh, a very interesting perspective on the uh, uh, opportunities photography is giving, but also uh, in the, uh, the way photography is lacking. Um, so is there anyone who would like to share uh, their perspective or would like to comment on what Kincho has said? I think that's uh, the character of art itself to to ask questions in general. But I think that's very, very important to start discussions about uh, very important issues, I think so. 
So, I mean, you're right. I think that you, we can't find solution, but we can start to find solution together because we, we get it, um, into discussions all together. And that's very, very fine, I think. Yeah, I also, I also would like to add, like, I agree that we will, I think with photography, we will not solve, so, uh, we will not find solution to problems. But I think what's, impo what's important and what photography can do is that uh, it can bring awareness and it can educate people of what is happening around us. And I think it's actually like hard to talk about these topics and it's hard to perceive this information like in any forms it can be in any form like text, audio or photography. But I think what photography um, has is that it can talk in uh, international language, which is visual language, and it can communicate with every person in the world. And this is, I think this is one of the most powerful thing that photography can do. And I think also what is important is that uh, photography can, can be like, uh, can be one photograph or it can be a big project. And um, what is good is that information which is written in text can be very complicated and hard to understand. But what photography can do, it can visualize the, this information, like uh, it can break it into pieces and this will be much easier to perceive and to digest, to, to understand what uh, photographer was trying to say and uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Natalia. So, um, Marco, uh, would you like to say something about this, maybe? Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm pleased to take part uh, in this conversation, uh, discussing a matter that is very dear to me um, and lays uh, at the core of my artistic research. Um, uh, I think that uh, on the topic of social photography, uh, the photographer is not a mere producer of images uh, um, external to the events and the, and the context in which he lives. Uh, the action of the photographer coincide with the people at the center of the story um, and the photographer has the opportunity to interpret reality and make their voice heard through the creative gesture. Uh, in addition to, to a more uh, narrative role, uh, documentary photography triggers profound reflections uh, and operates uh, on a political sphere. Uh, politics uh, here is intended not in the traditional terms, but uh, certainly uh, creating an imagine of the self uh, as a social animal or as a community is an important uh, political act that uh, even in a post-photographic era makes the language of photography alive, uh, present and fundamental. Um, uh, such political actor surely uh, calls for societal action and transformation, and it brings people closer and that the, uh, them to develop awareness uh, on social issues uh, seemingly far away from us. This has, uh, this has become ever so important and crucial as we experience a darker side of society. Um, characterized by uh, exclusive, uh, repressive and xenophobic behavior, for example. Um, for example, in the project I presented for Blurring the Lines, uh, my gaze was constantly turned to Sardinia military bases, uh, uh, which have caused uh, several pollution issues on the island uh, and are continuously used to test new death systems to be employed in real-life uh, conflicts. Um, I think that the attempt to, to narrate and shed some light into such a complex uh, matter is an important political act itself uh, that is screaming and wants to, to, to be seen and heard as far as possible and to start a conversation on issues surrounding war, politics and, and ecology, for example. Um, I have a, I have a question coming in from uh, Klaus in relation to what you have just said, um, uh, Marco. So, uh, based on what you just said, in the practice of photography, ethical issues tend to arise over the nature of creativity, representation, ownership, profit and service, often confused by the uh, application of new technologies and ex excess exacerbated by cultural preferences or political ide ideology, and of course, individual personality and ambition, how 
do the offer how do the others feel about the ethics responsibility as photographers so would would someone like to respond on that what do you see as your your ethical responsibility as a photographer uh, for me photographer is always an outsider and there's always a certain gaze involved in photography be it you know the the colonial gaze or you as an outsider is always an influence there and currently when i'm looking at all the photographs that are coming you know in the internet about certain group of people or talking about certain social issues there's always an outsider's gaze and many have even aesthetized uh, you know certain uh, underprivileged people just for the sake of you know the mass distribution that photography has so i think the major ethical implication that uh, we as photographers should be very careful about is how we portray our subjects because we as an outsider always tend to look at certain problems and sympathize for it but we never uh, move forward and try to empathize and sustain solidarity with the particular group of people that we are photographing Thank you, Siva. I think that's a very important um, perspective. Um, and what I have also um, heard uh, the others uh, saying um, is that um, the position of the photographer is, is uh, a never a solid uh, individual autonomous position, but it's something uh, that you have to do in collaboration with others. So others could be the political systems you work with as a photographer to actually create change. Uh, then the photographer is not on itself, uh, but you can um, create some sort of ecosystem in which people together uh, can create change. Um, and what I hear you saying, uh, Siva, is that at the same time, you also have to be very aware of your uh, positioning as, as an artist, as a photographer, in relation to um, the people you photograph or the people you work with, the people you represent. Um, and especially when it comes to the, um, the predominantly uh, white Western uh, gaze within photography, maybe. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Lisbeth, would you like to uh, add your perspective on this? I was about to say something anyways. Um, so I think that's a really good question and important um, topic to speak on because I think us as photographers or me as a um, social and documentary photographer, um, always try to ask myself while I photograph um, already to think about, okay, but how can I give back as I usually photograph um, societies outside out of my own, um, yeah, not comfort zone, but place where I live. And um, yeah, I kind of sometimes feel like, oh, okay, I am invading the space that is not uh, made of, of people who are maybe like me, who have been brought up like me. How can I actually, as a photographer, maybe through my work, um, connect, first of all, the project and my subject, but also um, how can I give back in a sense of um, actually having the people I take something from, um, uh, yeah, have a positive effect on their lives, in a sense. Um, and I think we should be asking that because as yeah, photographers, it's often about, okay, we take the photo and then where does the photo go? Where do we take it? But we never really ask the question, okay, but what happens to the people that we took the photo of? Or actually, how does their story continue? Um, and I think the, yeah, the focus should continue to be on the subject even after, yeah, taking the photo. So I believe that's as well important. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, our role. One and how do you th do that? Um, well, <laughs> I have I have grand plans, and um, I'm very inspired by the French photographer JR, who often works with uh, yeah the communities he photographs in and tries to improve their lives in a sense in very creative ways. But personally, um, it starts with, for example, um, giving the photos in a nice way back to the people you took a photo of, because to them often. A personal portrait can mean a lot or even, you know, they feel very honored 
that you actually take the photo of them and um, then receiving that photo later or seeing a book or like a copy of a book or a little magazine and having that bag that's like amazing for them, which they can show to their neighbors, their families. Um, but also, yeah, I was thinking about creating workshops in certain societies, always children um, of certain neighborhoods to kind of include them in the process and also, first of all, see their perspective, but also um, let them experience and try something that they would naturally maybe not have a chance to because their school system doesn't offer it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'm curious, Siva, how, how do you do this? Because you also work with marginalized communities, with people who are not uh, often given the stage or, or even have a voice. So how, how do you do that within your practice? Um, I think the first thing that I usually do when I'm uh, sort of talking about people who are uh, underprivileged or in the marginalized community is uh, how they want to be looked at. So the first thing I do is I sort of uh, show them how their community or uh, the group of people that they belong to have been photographed since now. So I get to know how they want to be seen. Uh, because the very first thing when I heard about Kashmir and when I was photographing Kashmiris is the representation of Kashmir when you just Google Kashmir and all the photographs that you see is of aggressive uh, Islamic masculinity. While if you actually go there and be with the people, that's not the case at all. And Kashmir is always portrayed as this uh, Islamic, aggressive Islamic community where, you know, uh, the photographs of women wearing hijabs and how uh, oppressive that is for the women and all that. But when you actually go there, when compared with the rest of the India, Kashmir is like way uh, more matriarchal than patriarchal. So these sort of things have sort of helped me to come up with a different uh, visual language and aesthetics where I talk to people and I understand how they want to be perceived rather than me going up with my own preconceived aesthetics into the place. Because like uh, Lisbeth said, it's me invading their space, their personal space to take their photograph. So I think that's how I do it. Okay, thank you. I'm also curious uh, for Ragna because you um, also create uh, your your own images often. Um, how does this work for you? How do you relate to these, these topics? Oh, we cannot hear you. Sorry for this. No, I'm also sharing the opinion the other mentioned already. I mean, I think it's very, very important to change the yeah, usual view of uh, point of view because we are very used to a special point of view. And um, I think it's very, very important to, to give, maybe to, um, to cooperate more with uh, the people you will take a photograph of. Because um, in my projects, for example, I'm not uh, traveling at the time a lot because of my family and so on, but um, I'm creating projects on special topics, uh, especially on philosophical topics. And um, I often find the, the people also around me, but I, I try to get them in, into my project more. You know, that means that I, I find the pictures I create, I'm, I do it in a way of uh, improvisation also. I'm doing it uh, with the others uh, in kind of a project. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very important part of the whole project to, to talk to, to the people and to um, find out what are they like to do and which kind of opinions they have on this special topic I'm dealing on. Uh, and so I hope that I will try more and more to cooperate um, stronger with others. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, you've all you've all mentioned that the actually engaging uh, with the people you work with, but also talking to them uh, and asking them questions um, and trying to portray them in a sincere way, but also to create more balance in the way they are represented. Maybe that's that, that that's very important. And that is something that you can do as a photographer. Um, 
So, uh, Tehna, I'm curious, do you have something to, to add to, to this? Um, um, yeah, I actually wanted to pick up on um, Siva's point on being an outsider as a photographer, because um, for me personally, my work kind of focuses on the Black creative community and issues that impact them. And as, um, although my work isn't, I wouldn't class it as documentary photography, it is informed by a lot of social issues. So I feel like I am an insider in terms of photographing like the creative community around me who I work with, some of them are friends. Um, and I think for me, it's important um, ethically as someone who's in the community to be very open about how I am um, like gathering in information or like um, documenting or, or using the information I gather to inform my work with um, the creatives I work with or, or take photos of um, because it is possible to become an outsider within your own community if you're not going about things the right way and I think another important thing for me because my work is informed by social issues is like turning the camera on myself as I feel I'm part of the community and relating with um, the people I photograph through sharing more about myself in my um, photogra um, photographic work so taking self portraits and just involving them in conversations about what I'm researching. Okay, thank you. That's very, uh, that's actually very important, I think, uh, what you just said also about um, trying to also be vulnerable yourself as a photographer and to, uh, to, to be respectful to the people you work with and also try to create an, a position in which that you are as equal as possible with the, the people you photograph. So, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a very important um, that's very important as a, as a young photographer. So thank you. We actually have a few questions uh, from our audience. So uh, the first one is coming from Tara Bogart. Uh, she says, hey, I'm here with beginning undergrad students who are working on finding their voices. Can you speak about how you consider awareness when you start a project? Would someone like to say something about that? Uh, I think that awareness uh, as um, doing research uh, before photograph, it's um, creating uh, um, a relationship between uh, uh, photography and other disciplines, uh, subjects uh, like science, uh, anthropology, uh, is uh, entering the field close to the context you, you want to tell and getting to, to know it closely. Uh, I think that's uh, about awareness. Would like to? Would someone else like to add something to that? Yeah, I would like to add something. Um, I uh, agree with Marco, but I also um, think, yeah, that awareness can come through a lot of things. Definitely, it's research, and I think depending on what project you're doing, it's really important to do the research before. But what I always call field research is actually talking to people on site and hearing their voices because. Um, for specific projects or topics, um, there's a lot of mixed information, I would say, online. Um, so I always like to talk to people on site and hear like their opinion and um, how they perceive maybe current circumstances or situation. And um, yeah, I use that as well in my research, like the personal side of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Siva, you would also like to... Uh, to me, awareness also, yeah. To me, awareness also comes with certain uh, level of understanding the historic aspect of that particular people or a place that you're going to photograph, and uh, sort of deviating from the way that it has been represented so far would also be a very uh, important part when you're, you know, approaching a certain project or certain people. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we have another question um, from Klaus Hoeknis from Paris, uh, Paris College of Art. Uh, so you are all very committed art, emerging artists to different social issues. Do uh, You have talked about people, communities and human beings in general. 
If we think about ecological issues, photography can be an excellent tool to raise awareness around it. In your opinion, how can photography shed light on sustainability issues? Would someone like to share? Yeah, I think uh, I would like to answer this question. Uh, I think, well, it's a diff difficult question, like how we can talk about environment in photography and how can we make changes through photography for the environment. Um, and I think uh, the more we raise and talk about the problems, uh, like ecological ones, uh, the better for making changes. It, uh, the I find that every contribution is important and uh, whether it be like text about ecological problem or it's, if it's photography, like every person perceives the information differently. Someone likes to read, someone likes to hear and someone uh, perceives the information visually. And I think it's important to provide all the, all the possible ways uh, how we can talk about this problem. And uh, yeah, it's important to not try to solve the, all the problems at once. And I think it's important to narrow the subject and uh, the, pro, the more precise it, it will be, uh, the more precise it is, the more, per, uh, the more precise it will get to the audience. And I think it will work better if we uh, talk about what we truly believe in and, the, and talk about it and the way we feel confident doing it whether it's like a one image or a big project or yeah, it can, it can get different shapes. And I think there is no good or like better or worse version of how to bring awareness to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, would, would someone else like to add maybe um, Ragna, because you also uh, create work, as you already said, about more of the philosophical topics, also related to sustainability. Uh, how do you reflect on this? Yeah, I think um, we can draw more attention on it. And especially, I mean, for example, Future um, Fridays for Future, it was a very good that they had this platform to to make uh, to draw attention on all these problems but i wanted to add another question how can uh, photography itself uh, become more sustainable uh, sustainable i'm sorry i'm <laughs> a little bit excited so um because we are we have a lot of uh, huge production of um pictures and cameras and all this stuff. So maybe we can draw this question to ourselves as photographers. I mean, also in our topics and the themes we, um, we are talking about, but also how can we change our mood of work maybe? That's uh, very interesting. Um, uh, would someone like to comment on that? How can photography Become, become more sustainable? I think that's uh, difficult because we live in a very um, yeah, over-consuming culture. And um, yeah, I think we have to make the choice uh, of being maybe... Um, yeah, setting our own limits because I feel like the limits are kind of, you know, put upon us by society of saying like, oh yes, here's a new camera and there's a new version, new, new, new. And we de develop this like feeling that we need the newest thing of something to uh, achieve the best quality of something because only the best quality photo will actually be printed or the best quality photo will get the most likes or whatsoever. Um, while I still believe in this very cliche sentence of like the best camera is the one that is on you and that is usually our phones and even those are improving but um, I think yeah that's a it's a really good question uh, that I haven't thought of myself but I believe that we maybe as photographers can also um, make a statement and saying okay um, I'm working with what I have on me even if it's not the newest thing and um, I think there are amazing iPhone photographers who maybe can make really strong images just with a phone or yeah, going back to analog, going back to um, what was and kind of reusing 
what has already been created. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, we will be ending uh, this uh, panel discussion. I think uh, the last question uh, could be some input to have a new panel discussion maybe next year uh, on how we can uh, create a more sustainable uh, photography environment. Um, is there someone of you who would like to add something to this panel discussion before we close off? No? Okay. I, so, yes, yes, please. Yeah, no, see that? Yeah, I would just like to add how, uh, add on to what Ratna said about sustainability of images and as photographers. I feel there is also an institutionalized habit of photography, which is pushing us for self gratification. And we are like ending up making billions and billions of images and bombarding with information. I feel how the institutions and other organizations control our images, like how Instagram's algorithms or Facebook's algorithms uh, control our images and the dissemination of images from a photographer itself can be a very interesting discussion, I guess. Mm -hmm. Just adding on to what Ratna said. Yes, thank you, thank you. I totally agree. We have one more question. Um, uh, so do you think beyond working on your single work, is there room to play more collectively on issues that are important on environment or social issues? I see a lot of uh, people nodding. So I think that that's a, a collective yes. <laughs> Would someone like to uh, give their point of view on that? Um, I think there is definitely more room to... Um collaborate with other people to document social issues um and I think I'm a big believer as well in people being the authors of their own stories so and or giving people the tools to tell their own stories even if it's a story you're interested in how can they tell it because they know it best um so I think maybe things like collaborating with photographers globally which is like which is really important for me personally I try and um connect with photographers in um, Africa, um, such as Ghana. Um, I do like a little film project where I send disposable cameras to Ghana because it's really hard for them to shoot film and develop it. And so when they shoot the film, it's brought back here, I develop it and send them the images and they will just take pictures of what's around them. And that's a form of documentary that I probably wouldn't be best suited to do. And it also um, allow them to play around so yeah I think like collaborating outside of your even country is really important um, especially because we can now connect with other people through social media quite easily. Yes thank you that's uh, what we're proving today uh, we are bringing people together from all over the world which is very exciting um, so thank you for that uh, Terna, uh, we have uh, one last question uh, from Steve Bisson. Do you think beyond working on our single works? Uh, oh, this was the same question. Okay, we already uh, we already did that one. So I would really like to thank you all for being here. Uh, it was my pleasure to uh, moderate this uh, panel discussion, and I am very excited to actually have seen your faces. Um, and I uh, hope to uh, collaborate and work with you in the future. Uh, so keep me updated on what you're doing. Um, let me know if there is something uh, I can help you with or Photodoc can help you with or blurring the lines in general can help you with. Um, um, uh, we will be closing off and uh, at uh, 12 o'clock, uh, the third panel discussion will uh, start with uh, the moderated by Steve Bisson from Urbanautica. Uh, so please stay tuned uh, and see you in uh, a little bit less than half an hour. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.
good morning and welcome to the third panel of this second international um, conference uh, of Blurring the Lines, which focuses on uh, photography and education. I'm Steve Bisson and I'll be the moderator of this third panel. Um, with me, um, uh, let me introduce uh, the participants of this uh, third panel. Um, uh, they are all recent graduates from different schools uh, worldwide. Um, Riti Sengupta, uh, welcome from uh, graduate from National Institute of Design, Gandhi Nagar, India. Um, Marina Istomina from Doc Doc Doc School of Modern Photography, uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. And we have uh, Leif Polevik from uh, Lucas School of Arts. In Brussels, Belgium, and Tolga Akbas from Mimar University, Istanbul, Turkey, uh, Zoe Slurs from IKV St. Jost Breda, the Netherlands, and um, Krafan Johnson of the School of Photography, Reykjavik, Iceland. So, welcome, board. Thank you for being here and joining the works of the conference. So, uh, we have a special topic for this third panel. Um, uh, the idea is to uh, think uh, uh, and discuss about uh, the meaning of being an artist or being a photographer. Um, we all know that um, definition often helps to make confusion. So we will try to challenge ourselves with this uh, um, topic. Um, and uh, let me add that. Uh, our practice today uh, as creatives, photographers, and image makers is informed by many issues, right? Uh, personal, first of all, uh, but also social, ethical, and not often these um, issues uh, fit into the labels, right? Um, and it's very likely that our approach uh, to seeking in, and within seeking and expressing our own voice um, do overlap this type of boundaries, right? Um, and um, I would also uh, like to add the fact that we are um, increasingly uh, witnessing um, uh, shared and collaborative practices within uh, photography and arts, which makes it more and more difficult again to think as, as an artist of photographers. Uh, however, as we discussed in the first panel of this morning, uh, we must communicate ourselves, right? We um, need to make our work, our works, uh, accessible, effectively accessible and understandable. And we need somehow to uh, position ourselves as well. Um, so this led us to questions like, um, for instance, uh, do we perceive ourselves as an artist or uh, is there any difference in, in between being a photographer and an artist or does this difference make sense uh, in the country we live, in the region we inhabit? Um, and also is a difference in between our personal and our professional work. So um, these are the questions we will try to answer together. Um, and of course, we'll be receiving also some questions from our audience. Um, so as long as I receive them, I will turn them to you. Um, so feel free to jump into this very particular subject, which relates somehow to our identity as artists and photographers, how we perceive ourselves and how we would like to be perceived from the audience, from our clients, from our targets, our uh, audience. So, um, who is up to you to, to start then? I can start if you want. <laughs> yeah, sure, Marina, go for it. Uh, so, uh, firstly, I think it depends uh, on the approach uh, and artistic photographer's statements, if you feel that 
your photographer and the photographer status is more convenient for you, you should use it. Um, so usually in my projects, uh, I use a kind of um, performative photography and I create my own uh, narrative um, with different types of images. There are archival images, staged photography, documentary, still lives, portraits. And in this case, um, I agree photography really exists in many ways, but I consider myself uh, an artist because it gives me freedom. Um, I don't have any limitations in technique, for example. Uh, I can show ideas in many ways uh, with many instruments and methodology. And also I can talk um, differently about a concept without being tied to a specific medium. Um, however, uh, when I finished my first project, I represented myself as a photographer. Uh, but one day I felt that um, I know how to do it, how to take the pictures. Uh, and I felt that it's not so easy for me, but I started to think like a scam uh, for the different issues or problems. And um, uh, I felt some fear maybe. And since that moment, I understood that I should find more forms, new forms, new aesthetics or methods um, to improve something inside my head. And, and uh, since that moment, I began to think firstly about uh, the idea and then how I can express it not only with photography. Um, I think it's about expansion of methodology maybe and approach to a specific story. Um, secondly, I, um, I uh, understand that it depends on the situation, because when I work um, with some organizations or when I want to get some access to bureaucratic structures uh, in Russia, <laughs> I represent myself as a photographer because it's more practical and maybe clear because they they these people who are not inside of this art area uh, they know what expect from you as photographer but um, with the artists it's not so clear yeah so I think yeah it's really depends on the situation. So uh, it's interesting what you say because it, it, it, it takes us to think about the fact that maybe compared to the past, we need to be much more flexible. Yeah. You now, according to the situation, to, to the people we are approaching, uh, uh, more and more we need to, to be um, flexible in a way, you know? And so um, what about Leaf? What about your uh, experience in in Brussels then, although you are now studying again in Belgium in another school, I know. So um, tell us about your experience within school, for instance, how, um, is, if this type of topic was an important um, in, your, in your background um, experience uh, at Lucas in Brussels, and if it's becoming also uh, an issue, this uh, thinking about your identity as, a, as an artist or a photographer in your school today. Yeah, uh, me, I was, uh, I did a bachelor first at Eusa Le 75, which is much more known for uh, documentary photography uh, and approach. So it's much, it was much more about the image. And then when I arrived in uh, Lucas School of Arts in the photography department also, uh, I was in contact with people who had a more artistic approach. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that. Uh, me, I was mo more considering myself as a photographer at that, at that time, but I still much more consider myself as a photographer, but still have a photographic practice and identity, but also an artistic practice and an identity. So it's a kind of a mix where you have your own expression uh, because uh, being a photographer is not necessarily uh, um, uh, limited into the, the word the world of arts and uh, and culture and artists too. So so it's much more because photographer can be also in the information or on news. 
So I will much more consider myself uh, as a, someone who is a worker into the the arts and culture and by extension information uh, uh, context. Understand? And do, do you think it's not working that much now? <laughs> I cannot hear. You were in the school. I mean, um, in your school, you uh, were uh, somehow um, brought to think about, um, uh, forced somehow to think yourself as a documentary photographer, for instance, or like a, a type of uh, visual maker, or uh, were you trained also to, uh, to a more ex uh, experimental um, experience, or to try different mediums? How was your experience with this regard? Um, so there was a small uh, problem, connection problem when you asked the, your question at the beginning, but uh, so I don't know if I uh, hear well the beginning, but uh, still. Um, uh, so I have a, a tool to, to work that is uh, my camera. And then, so I produce images and I make images and I was often oftenly asked, oh, what, what is your profession or your work? And I said, I make a photography. And people say, oh, what kind of photography? And I just say, oh, I make photography because uh, I can use um, my photographs uh, as a resource, as material resource to, to create things. I don't know, something like a, a book or, or something else. So uh, I see photography and, uh, and photographs I produce as a material resource that then can uh, uh, concretize the materials into something uh, concrete. For instance, okay, so, thanks. And I, I'm not uh, limited into photography. It's my medium for the moment. But uh, yeah, but uh, there's some people who are also uh, because in Luca, people were at the end in, in the photography department. We are talking about uh, lens-based artists. So bec because there were people working with video in photography department. So it was another uh, another dimension of the photography. Uh, ID, it really depends the context, the school, the country also. Of course, yeah, that's another thing. Uh, Zoe, what about your experience in the Netherlands and Breda? Uh, is this type of uh, um, identity uh, label somehow affected your journey in the school and how you envision, try to envision yourself as a young uh, visual maker? Yeah, definitely. It was interesting what you were saying, Neef, about um, uh, well, the, the name of the, the course you're doing, which is then um, Lens-Based Artist. Uh, with us, it changed over the time. We studied photography and film for four years, and then just before we graduated, it was photography, film, and the digital. Um, and this is because people in our class, there were people in our class that didn't even touch the camera. We, they were just making installations or doing something completely digital without a camera. Um, which is very interesting. So people were doing very different stuff and we, most of us didn't feel very limited to the medium at all. Um, having said that, I do think I'm a photographer in the sense that I do use photography most of the time. Um, but when I got the question and when I got the email to um, contribute to this conversation, I immediately thought of my, the um, photographer I did my internship at, uh, Annegien van Doorn. She has on her website, it says, um, I'm a visual artist, but on documents and at parties, I call myself photographer. And I think that's such a great uh, introduction. Um, and it's the same as Marina was saying as well, um, that at certain moments, it's just easier to say that you're a photographer, but sometimes it can feel kind of limiting um, to just call yourself photographer. Um, especially now that I've graduated, I. Um, kind of figured out that right now I can play with clay again and do something completely different. Uh, last weekend, uh, I live with two of my former classmates uh, and we invited some uh, an artist over as well and we built uh, blanket forts all weekend and that was an art project. Um, and of course we documented this with cameras because we're comfortable with cameras um, and it's a great way to, to keep this fort alive uh, even when we take it down. Um, but it's very freeing to know that there's other ways to tell stories than just photography. Um, 
Although I do feel really comfortable in telling stories through um, photography, yeah. <laughs> Um yeah, it's it's interesting what you uh, both you and Marina said about the fact that it's convenient somehow at some point to say that you're a photographer. Um, so it sounds like in a, in a, a commission at the world, it, it pays back a little bit more than say an artist. So um, I'm curious about um, then, how do you uh, relate? This was an issue uh, we, we talked about this morning in the first panel about how the impact um, of uh, technologies, you know, how we not just relate to technologies, but how we use technologies to shop our work and to show up our identity as well as, a, as artists or visual makers. So uh, I think this uh, um, question of um, technologies and models, new models of uh, distributing our photography, our images affect our, our work, our practice. So I'm asking turning the same question to you because I guess this is interesting here. Because do we turn ourselves out there as artists or as photographer? How do we show up? You know, how do you relate to this type of issues? Because at the end, this is part of the game, right? Uh, using this, these techniques, these mediums. Now our daily base. Yes, definitely, especially when you look at social media and uh, where you contribute uh, or distribute. I mean, um, the work that you make. Uh, I think sometimes it's it's a pity that uh, a lot of images only end up on Instagram and and they get seen on there. And um, I myself really love photography books, and I really value the the actual holding of an object and the story it can tell and. Um, I think that's such a beautiful thing. And I think in the photography world, um, photo books are still very much loved. Um, but it's also interesting to look at different ways um, to, to show your work in digital ways as well. It's, it's inevitable that it's a part of our lives now. Um, so it's interesting to, to look at the ways you can uh, show your work uh, online or digital. Um, but I still, I, I really love photo books. So I would never, um, how do you say, I never forget about the books. Uh, yeah, they'll always be part of photography for me. Yeah, this is an interesting um, point, uh, that of the photo books. Because again, sometimes, I'm being a publisher myself, right? Uh, sometimes I uh, question myself, am I doing photo art books or I'm just doing photo books? So again, the definition is not that easy, the border of the definitions. Uh, we, but thinking about the words we use, I think it's a good exercise. That's what makes sense of this panel, I guess, that sometimes we use words without really questioning them very much. So I'm eager to hear what Riti uh, think about uh, herself uh, as a photographer or an artist, and mostly also hear how this type of um, labeling or uh, identity issues uh, uh, works in her own country, uh, in India. Hi, so um, I think I identify very much as a photographer and a photographer who is also trying to make art. Because at the creation day and day. Riti, hold on. Can you just turn, try to turn a little bit uh, louder the, your voice? Just, just a little bit, because I hear it a little bit low. Uh, am I audible now? Can you hear me clearer? Yeah, turn it up, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone can hear you, probably. OK. Yes. Yeah, now which, is it better? Yeah, it sounds a little bit better. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I identify myself very much as a photographer, but also as a photographer who is trying to make art as opposed to making only just images. Because how I look at photography is that everybody has access to a camera at the present age, so everybody can make a photograph. So, as an artist, what more can I do with my images? How can I say more stories or inform people through my work? So that becomes important to me. 
I'm also at a stage in my journey where I have just begun my journey in photography. So I'm very open to experimenting and trying different things uh, with the medium itself. It is very fascinating uh, how photography allows for interactions with other different mediums, like for example, with text or with illustrations or sound. So when all these things come together, it feels just, it's not just photography anymore, it, it scope becomes bigger and it allows more people to also engage with it. So that is what I find interesting about the medium. And I think I'm always at a crossroad between being a photographer and being an artist and trying to think how the two definitions are always altered and how, how things are just, you know, like sometimes more leaning towards being a photographer or leaning more towards being an artist. So yeah, mostly this kind of thing. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, what I find interesting, uh, one of the, th the things I find interesting, what you've just said, and I will turn it to the others uh, member of this panel because I think it's an interesting point. Um, you said that uh, a lot of people uh, today use photography, right, um, with different type of uh, tools like camera, tablets, phones, whatever. Um, so somehow, um, as many, many people can take pictures, let's say, uh, today. Um, uh, do you feel that this is leading, um, uh, or have you ever had this type of thought, of course, uh, it's leading people to think themselves rather more as artists than photographers, because photographers, because everyone is photographer, basically. Um, that's like a, a pitfall of technology, because broad, uh, tools is like a democratization of the process, um, which has positive and negative side, of course, but somehow is like an inflated medium now. So have you have a thought uh, uh, uh, with regard to this distinction of being an artist and a photographer uh, at yourself um, using uh, a medium that is very much popular in a way. Is this a problem for you? Is this uh, concern you somehow? It is sometimes a problem because we are saturated with visual information. Every day in the morning, we look at our phones and our generation is a very visual generation. We have access to a lot of visual material. So I think uh, maybe in the past, when we looked at an image, it had a certain impact on us. And nowadays, it's more difficult for an image to have the same kind of impact. So your image has to have something more to make uh, that kind of a lasting impact on a person because you're always looking at images. So yes, this makes the work more challenging for photographers or artists because we have to somehow demarcate ourselves from the vast pool image making which is always happening uh, but it's also interesting because I think uh, for any medium of art and photography is perhaps a comparatively more a new medium uh, as compared to maybe painting or other mediums so for any medium to develop I think it's good to have more people engage with it and that is how to ups and downs it takes a certain form over time so I think it's both uh, good and bad like it has both its positives and negatives Right, right, right. Of course, this this type of uh, a question um, are meant to you know uh, help us to uh, think about the issues. Uh, most of these questions they don't have uh, a specific answer, a definitive answer. The good thing is about um, uh, listening. It's about listening to the possible perspective uh, that exists around the issues. Um, we haven't heard Tolga yet. Um, so, um, Tolga, would you like to bring your own perspective through um, Atis? Atis is helping you with the translation. Kendi görüşünü söylemek ister misin Tolga dedi? Seni hiç duyamadık dedi. Evet, beni hiç duyamadınız. Sanatla ilgili görüşümü soruyor değil mi? Sanat ve fotoğraf konuştuğumuz şeyde. Aynen öyle. Evet, şöyle diyelim o zaman. Ben kendimi sanatçı...
Duyamadık. Umut Yap. Şu an geliyor mu sesim? Evet. Ee, ben şu an tekrar gitti. Peki. Ya kendi kendine kapanıyor bu. Nasıl yapacağız bunu? Bilmiyorum. Şu an geliyor ses. Şu an geliyor mu? Evet. Otomatik kapanıyor. Kendimi sanatçı ve fotoğrafçı olarak görmüyorum. Daha çok bir flaner olarak görüyorum kendimi. Şehirde aylak aylak geziyorum. İstersen burasını çevir. Tamam. I do not uh, define define myself as a photographer or artist. I'm a uh, walking around in the city and taking photographs. Yani e, bunun dışında bir sanatçı olmak etik, etik, etiketiyle ilgili bir şey sormuşlar. Ondan da bahsedeyim. Yani bu etiketin olumsuz etkileri olduğunu düşünüyorum. Yani sanatçı etiketinin olumsuz bir etkisi olduğunu düşünüyorum. Çünkü sanatçı etiketiyle beraber bir takım egolar da beraberinde geliyor. Çevirebilirsin. Uh, I do not like uh, tag tag as an artist because uh, if you tag as an artist Uh, it uh, comes with an ego, uh, ego problems with it. Bunun dışında Türkiye'de sanatçı olmanın e, bir fark yaratıyor mu ülkenizde diye bir soru var. Ona da cevap vereyim. E, evet yani dediğim gibi sanatçı olmak bir takım egolar getiriyor ve bence üretim e, sürecini kısıtlıyor. Ben bu yüzden kendimi bir sanatçı olarak görmüyorum. Daha çok dediğim gibi flanör gibi şehirde aylak aylak geziyorum, çevremi gözlüyorum. Projelerim de zaten e, bu yüzden çok yavaş ilerliyor, çok uzun süreçler anlatıyorum. Ateş. Uh, ben arti- uh, as I said uh, before being an artist tagged an artist is uh, comes with difficulties and ego problems I think so uh, I uh, do not want that tag on me actually like I said before I want to just walk around in the city and decide my projects as photographer or artist it's uh, not important for me as a Being an Artı bir şey daha söyleyeceğim. Ben okula başlamadan önce daha çok fotoğraf çekiyordum. Ama okula başladıktan sonra fotoğraf makinesini elimden bırakıp daha çok dışarıdaki gözlere, işte bu güvenlik kamerası olabilir, bir herhangi bir televizyon görüntüsü olabilir onlara yöneldim. Çok uzun süreden beri de hiç elime fotoğraf makinesi alıp fotoğraf çekmiyorum. I want to say this... Before I started to uh, art school, fine art school, I uh, doing lots of photography jobs and taking lots of photography. But after the start of the school, I dropped my camera and uh, go on thinking like uh, different, not like a uh, photographer uh, as it is. Şimdilik bu kadar Ateş. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tolga, for sharing with us your um, ideas. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we we all we all uh, are concerned with the fact that labels are not very nice, indeed. You know, we we are uh, of course we have all our own identity, and often, as I mentioned at the very start of the panel, this um, uh, our perspective, our practice, all, always. Uh, uh, overlap these boundaries, you know, um, and go all beyond the boundaries. So I totally understand to your position. What, what is important is maybe that when we have to um, get our work out there and get our work to an audience, uh, both being a photographer and artist, then we need to be um, accessible in a way. And then becomes the problem, how we want to be perceived. That's, And that led us to that question we, we made before about uh, how should we use the medium, the technologies we have to, to bring our work out there to an audience. Um, but again, there is no definitive answer. And um, we have a few more minutes uh, before uh, finishing. Not sure I'm seeing, I'll see if we get some questions. But meanwhile, um, Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about um, how um, um, 
this issue, uh, this topic, um, should impact within schools, right? Um, uh, as this morning we talked uh, about the fact that um, often the topic of how using uh, technologies is, um, is not part of the curricula, let's say. And likewise, I would like to ask you if you think that this type of um, questions, uh, issues should be uh, more included uh, in the schools um, or not. That's my, my question. Excuse me, this question for Tolga? It's for everybody, it's for okay. Tolga as well, right? Well, I can I can contribute a little bit. Um, I think in in the the studies I did, um, we were relatively free in in um, what kind of medium we wanted to use um, and what we wanted to call ourselves. But we were pushed in a way to um, to have a title to to um, uh, how do you say it to present yourself as or a photographer or a, a filmmaker or someone in between, but have a label to it. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting question, whether it's, I don't know if I have the answer to how education in art should be done, um, not at all. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that uh, after graduating, I finally kind of felt that I could do completely different things to photography. Although in our school, it was very much promoted to try different things in the first, uh, half year of our studies you don't even study a specific course you try everything for a little while and then you choose what you want to do and even in that situation you can still kind of switch so I believe we were kind of um, brought up to be artists anyway uh, to be kind of free in the medium you want to use and um, yeah use them as, as fits to the project you're doing um, but still you were made to choose a label, which is fair enough because you want to present yourself to the world and you're gonna have to have a name for yourself. Uh, so it's fair to have a label, I guess. But sometimes it, it's difficult because it feels like you're stuck with that label, which is of course not true. Um, but yeah, it's interesting for myself. I I felt for the first time after, after graduating um, to be com completely free again, to be able to start my whole um, reflection uh, at who am I what, what do I want to make do I have to be a photographer do I want to be a photographer do I want to be an artist so I think it's an interesting time for me or for anyone who just graduated to like uh, revisit that thought of who am I and who do I want to be yeah yeah it's, it's it's I think we we are free to change uh, within our path, our journey, and that's why these labels are very difficult and, and heavy, and heavy, because we have uh, room and time enough to change, to become a photographer and then an artist and then turn back to photographer. I think that uh, we have to think this way. Um, of course, schools need to to deal with both both. Um, Issues so prepare uh, students to uh, and to understand what being a documentary photographer, for instance, is or an architectural photographer is, and at the same time, yes, they have to leave the freedom as in your first year, Zui, um, to to to test to experiment. Uh, but after graduation, then it's it's it's a new school, it's the life school, and then it becomes. Uh, uh, as you said, there is uh, there is more freedom, even more paradoxically, than schools to to try things. Uh, Marina, what about in in school in St. Petersburg? Uh, uh, Doc Doc Doc, you know, uh, we know because uh, Doc Doc Doc have been part of the the network for a couple of years now, and I know that the, um, we have seen different works, graduation works coming from your school, and and there is a strong documentary approach, I would say. Uh, and how did you then uh, instead perceive your your journey, your experience in this specific school? Uh, 
Yeah, but now Dr. Doc has uh, two directions, documentary photography and experiences in contemporary photography. So uh, I graduated uh, the second one. That's why uh, I think uh, we are also free to choose our uh, our statues. We are an, uh, the artists or uh, photojournalists or photographers. Um, that's why yeah, I appreciate uh, it, uh, the situation that we can choose, of course. Um, so I think we are free and, um, and yeah. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Um, Liv, I, I saw you raise your hands. Yeah. Okay, go yeah. for it. Yeah, because also uh, schools are a place to mean, a uh, place to learn also. Uh, some uh, uh, um, um, ah shit! I just forgot the word in my two languages. That's just this <laughs> yeah, to to learn a discipline, and um, but it's also some place when you can experience. Um, I don't know, for instance, a, a certain politicization. I know in France, uh, people also in public school or university, people uh, experience uh, political experience. And so uh, it's about freedom also. And when we, when we don't have this freedom, for instance, with the new law that getting vote in France that forbid uh, to occupy school and can be punished by three years of prison and to diffuse also police officers in duty and police officers in duty can carry on their, their guns into theater, museums. Uh, outside the school, you can naturally make anything. So for photographers, reporters, journalists, but also for workers of the arts and culture, it can be a danger when you uh, take the right, because as workers, we also have rights to represent what we want uh, and to express. So it really depends the country you are in also. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing this. Um, this has been a point highlighted in the, in the previous two panels as well, how the, uh, the huge differences that we uh, do face in our so-called globalized world, right? Um, so, and I think what we're trying with, with this uh, conference, but moreover with um, this Blurring the Lines project is to gather pers different perspectives from different countries every year. Um, because what you just pointed out is certainly crucial because we, there is no mainstream uh, argument. Uh, the argument change with local uh, circumstances always, and it's never the same. It change, it change with time as we do change with time. So yeah, definitely um, there are more and more restrictions out there uh, around the fact of taking pictures. It's not just about friends. Um, so this is an issue, this is an issue. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe it would be nice, for instance, to, to hear us what Riti or Tolga have to, to, to, to say about uh, bringing experience from their own country uh, that um, we don't often hear about, um, at least in our um, small perspective of Europeans. I'm sure if you want to add something, feel free, of course. I think in India, uh, there are very few photo schools for students to go to and study as compared to Europe or our Western counterparts. Um, there is also a lot of very good photographers who are self-taught. So always uh, a balance of university educated photographers and self-taught photographers and not necessarily always a difference in their process of working. Sometimes it can also be very similar. Uh, I studied photography in a design school, uh, not really an art school. So again, that for me added one more layer of complexity because with design, I always thought that design is something you make for the other and with photography, the need to turn the lens inwards as much as outwards. So these labels of, I was for the longest time very confused as to whether I was being educated to become a photographer or a designer or an artist. 
And after a point, it really didn't matter because what mattered is that I had something to say and photography served as a way for me to say it because what, what, when words didn't come to me and things seemed complex, I was able to make an image of it. So I think uh, when, when as young graduates, we go to school more than thinking of whether we're making an image as a photographer or artist, as designer, it is more important to make that image and to know whom that image is for, what do you want to say through that image and things like that, you know? So I think uh, educational institutes, I think I very much agree with Zoe that I do not think there is uh, any right or wrong way to teach art or if art can at all be taught to somebody. But I think uh, what art does help one do is ask questions, critical questions. And uh, it doesn't matter whether you are answering them as a photographer or an artist, as long as you're learning how to answer them in some way. Uh, definitely. Um, um, I see the, uh, a question here, um, which um, maybe will help us to focus on the last um, uh, perspective uh, of this topic. And is asking, it's actually is a statement, it's not a question, it's saying that if to become uh, an architectural photographer, uh, you surely need a strong background in architecture. So let me reframe this statement and make it uh, maybe more uh, general for everybody. Um, of course, um, I think uh, that more and more in the future, like if we want to be a landscape photographer as much as an architectural photographer or um, even a documentary photographer, more and more we will need uh, to dialogue or be aware of a need of a dialogue with other disciplines. This was also highlighted in the previous panel with Lisanne Fahappen uh, around social and environmental awareness. If you want to tell a good story about environment or social issues, we firstly need to understand and, and be aware about what we're talking about, right? And not often, as for example of architecture or photographer, which is like a, a niche of photography, um, we have the skills and the knowledge we need to do that. That's why the, provo the pro very provocative statements say, okay, if you want to be an architectural photographer, maybe you need an architectural background, uh, which makes sense in a way, and tell us that probably, um, especially if we want to be a photographer rather than an artist, but not just, it's not anymore like that. Before, there are many artists that are like activists that are concerned with real issues and they feel they need, that they have to expand their knowledge. So my question, my last question to you, do you ever felt the need to expand your knowledge beyond the fact of being a photographer or an artist then? Uh, if I can uh, Yeah, sure. Everybody. Um, yeah, I think of course, of course, if you do a project, uh, you dive into the material that you're talking about or, or telling a story about. I don't think to take architectural pictures, you need to be an architect or for or any other example. Um, but of course, you do your research. And you, when you talk about something, you want to um, you want to be sure that you're telling a story based on facts and on um, and on truth. But I do think it's I think if, if we're talking about architectural pictures, I think someone if, if an architect will take pictures of a building those images will be very different to an artist taking pictures of a building and that's super interesting and i don't think one is better than the other um it will just be different and it's um yeah it's i think it again it depends on how you uh, distribute those images um and what they're used for if they're used in an architectural magazine maybe it's better to um, have an architect take the pictures with an artistic eye or something. Um, but if it's meant to be art, it could be way more interesting to have an artist that knows a little bit about um, architecture to take the pictures because they just cause they look differently at the building or at whatever they're taking pictures of. So I don't think there's again, I don't think there's a right or wrong in this. Um, but yeah, there's there's a difference, of course, yeah. Anyone else uh, that would like to add anything to this um, need of understanding 
situations in a much broader way that takes us to be able to listen and dialogue with other disciplines. Uh, if you have had an experience in this direction, I think it's about that. I think it's about the fact that both the photographer and the artist will then need much more in the future uh, and the ability, the skill to listen and be able to dialogue with other disciplines, much more than in the past, right? I think that it's really important to be in dialogue. And I think uh, um, it is more about cultural awareness and it's important for a photographer and also for an artist. Uh, and um, if you're, you're doing a great research, you, are, you have some additional forces to do something, to be in, uh, an inspiration, to create something more complex. Uh, that's why I think that it's really important to be attentive to this world in general. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Uh, anyone else would like to conclude or say something else about this issue? Other ideas, other things? Ateş, ben bir şey söyleyeceğim. Orada evet, evet. Ee, şimdi şöyle söyleyeyim, disiplinler arası çalışmak şart ama bilinen e, disiplinler dışında başka şeyler de gerekiyor artık günümüzde. Mesela ben son zamanlarda yazılım ve donanım bilgisinin zayıflığı ile ilgili çok büyük problemler yaşıyorum. Bunu söyleyebilirsin. Uh, of course you have to uh, work interdisciplinary in today's world, but uh, also uh, you have to know software in our uh, society, software and uh, tech, actually. Artı şöyle de bir, e, bir şey var. Yani sanat okulları belki de liseden sonra geçilecek okullar değil, e, bir eğitimin üzerine alınacak okullar olsa daha yararlı ve üretime daha katkısı olacağını düşünüyorum. Yani atıyorum, öncelikle mü mühendislik eğitiminin üzerine işte güzel sanatlar, fotoğraf, heykel, resim neyse gibi. Uh, I think uh, fine arts uh, studies have to be after some other uh, disciplinary works, disciplinary education like uh, engineering uh, or anything else. Uh, after the high school, uh, if you start uh, uh, educating as a fine art students, it's not uh, enough, I think. Bu kadar. That's it. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you again, Tolga. Um, what you just uh, highlighted, uh, Tolga, is uh, especially the, the intrusive power of technology is actually going to be um, part of my uh, speech tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically on how technologies are affecting the scenario in which we move today as photographer or image makers. So um, I definitely agree with that uh, concern. Um, not sure if you have, I see a last question here from the audience say, if you are graduated from photography, what will be the difference between visual artists and a lens-based artist. Oh, and this is becoming more and more tougher. Uh, I think, I think. Well, feel free to answer. But I got what, what? What's the difference uh, between being a visual artist or a lens-based artist? I think it's a matter of uh, wording, probably. Um, um, I think this type of question is is what actually should lead us to think about our vocabulary. And uh, about uh, and that's always a good exercise, like etymology, rethinking about uh, the words we use. Um, I think this type of definition that is like a good exercise, but they don't have to become heavy labels on us. That's I think is the basic message uh, uh, I have to I have as an answer to this question. But I don't know if you have other. Um, position with regard to this difference in, between visual artists and lens-based artists. 
of course, visual is a little bit broader, right? And you don't, you're not constrained in with lens, basically. But um, maybe it's too easy like that. If you don't, I will. I don't I want to be the, the first one to answer again, but um, <laughs> very shortly, I think every lens-based artist is a visual artist, but not every visual artist is a lens-based artist. Like you said, maybe it's too easy to think like that, but um, a visual artist is it's more of a broad term. I think it's like exactly like you said, it's just wording um, is way more of a broader term and a lens-based artist might be uh, restricted to the lens. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I think at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree, I agree. I totally agree with you. Um, it's, it's, but it's still, it's still playful to <laughs> joke with words. Um, and that's, you know, as you, as you said before, you started out with a course and ended up with other words at the end uh, after a few years. So, um, so uh, we are over time. So I please, um, I would like to say thank you for contributing to the panel. Um, please keep in touch with us. Uh, we are eager to learn more about your future and what you will be doing now that you're done with the graduate, uh, with your with your degree. Um, let me invite you, uh, you all and audience included, to uh, our next panel, which will now happen in the afternoon um, at five, again with Lisanne Van Happen. So feel free to join for us for the next panel. And thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.
Welcome everyone to this international conference about photography and education in which finalists and winners from the Blurring the Lines program take part. Thank you European Cultural Center, Paris College of Art and Urbanautica for inviting me and organizing this conference. On behalf of Photodoc, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Lisanne van Happe and I'm the head of talent development at Photodoc. I have been part of the Blurring the Lines jury for the last three years and it has been a great honor to be part of this talent program. Within this fourth panel of this conference, uh, we will be talking about photography related to social topics in society. Um, the topic, uh, what we will be talking about is uh, the following. In a world that has become significantly globalized with regards to image production, do you think your studies have prepared you to better navigate and understand the world? At the same time, we live in a world that is consider considerably uh, polarized in local politics, in international politics, and on issues of race, gender, and privilege. Has globalization triggered a lack of attention to local issues of understanding of local visual languages and concerns? Can local concerns bring more depth to your understanding of global concerns? Uh, I will be talking about this topic with my panel. Um, uh, we have five participants. Uh, the first one is Lucas Pondolfo. He graduated from the Paris College of Art in Paris, France. Uh, we have Juliette Alma uh, from the École Nationale Supérieure Louis Lumière uh, in Paris, France. Uh, we have Marte Boyer, Builder Nordic School of Photography in Oslo, Norway. Uh, we have Gabriela Elena Suarez, Centro de la Imagen, Mexico City, Mexico. And we have Nadia Adler, from the Bezalel Academy of Arts and Design in Jerusalem, Israel. I will first give the floor to Gabriela. Uh, Gabriela, could you maybe share your perspective on this topic with us? Um, hello. Um, yes, um, I write something. Um, in the work that I'm presenting in Belo, in English Bail, I speak from a female body in a dangerous city and a dangerous country to be a woman, from the territory that has constituted me, my home, my body, my city. These places have shaped my aesthetic experience of transit and understanding the world in various ways, in this case, from fear. I have questioned myself various things, from the aesthetic and plastic point of view, around the representation of the fear to disappear, being murdered or raped, the origin of this type of violence violence and the way those have been systematized and normalized to the degree that there are hardly any public policies seeking to eradicate gender violence. The use of image, the use of image that turned this violence into a, an a spectacle to generate an anesthesia to the pain of others or avail to the reality that at the same time keep us up from seeing such a saturation. These thoughts forced me to look these talks for me to look for other ways of making images from other narratives or aesthetic, whether with a cathartic or a denouncing purpose. In a paradoxical case, I made this image from what could be considered the periphery. However, I consider that gender violence is an epicenter of global problems and therefore urgent to be solved. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriela. Um, I know that you have written this text uh, up front because you're not very comfortable with speaking English, but uh, I do have a, a question in related to your uh, text because um, your work is about um, a lot of also local and national topics going on in, in your country, uh, especially also uh, violence against women. Uh, which is also an international topic at this moment. So do you feel that you, as a photographer, have the tools to um, develop a project that is, at the one hand, reflecting on local and national um, things that are happening, and on the other hand, also on the international stage or platform? Sí, voy a contestar. I'm going to speak in, in Spanish and then I'm going to have someone to translate. Um, my, um, ¿Está listo? Este, creo que, que sí, que definitivamente con las herramientas, sobre todo en las formas en las que hemos abordado 
eh, los, los temas, tanto en la escuela como en la Facultad de Filosofía, tenemos la oportunidad de abordar este tipo de temas desde diferentes perspectivas, desde lo social, la filosofía, la construcción de la imagen. En... Uh, yes, I, I think that I have the, the correct tools from the, from the school, the center of the, uh, the image and the faculty of philosophy where I study. Um, I, I, I think that we have the, the, the tools adequate to to perform this this this work. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would like would someone else uh, from the panel like to respond or give their own perspective on the topic we're talking about? Um, yeah. Or do you want to go, Lucas? <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think it's a really important matter with. Uh, gender violence and I definitely see it as as like a global concern because in every country and in every school and in every institute they it's it's all about teaching of manners and how we teach our kids to behave and how we are being accepting to behave or, or behavior we see around us and I think this this goes way beyond just like a little town in Mexico or an, another little country like far, far away, at least for me, because I see I see it in, in my city and in Oslo, which is supposed to be a very safe city to be. But as a female and as a girl, you always have different, I don't know, fears that I see that my male friends don't have. So I see that this is definitely something we need to talk about in school and teach your kids about gender violence and about the forms that it can come in and the social control and also how we treat women and or anyone really on the street because this is to me it's come down almost to like violence against certain type of people thank you very much would someone like to respond on that how yes. is that for you maybe nadia i wanted to, to add that when i was uh, reading firstly the the description the topic that we're going to talk about today I was thinking about the large issues that we have in the world and the politics and uh, in, the, uh, in the relations between the genders and just all the big things that the media is talking about. I was thinking that it, it is very easy to talk about uh, it in, in a large image, in a large scape. Uh, and just to focus, um, I think like the, the main uh, problem is kind of uh, getting out of the focus because Every large idea and every large issue begins with a with a single man and with a single idea that uh, starts uh, somewhere in the suburbs, let's say, and uh, it all the origin of the problem begins small. And I think uh, us as a photographers, we have the power to not to blow up, but to uh, make others to pay attention to everyday surroundings and just ourselves and our actions and to tell the story the the smaller story that kind of can talk for a broader audience i think uh, the more our work is uh, personal and subjective the more universal it can be for each and every one of us and uh, for the whole world <laughs> i think that um, you can talk big through small gestures um, Like I'm a very naive, let's say, person, and uh, I think that kindness and empathy are the best ways to get closer to our surroundings in order to understand uh, the issues that each and every one of us uh, has or goes through. Uh, and in the in, at the end of the day, like these are the large problems that we are conquering, like as a society. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. That's uh, quite hopeful, let's say. Um, let me see. Uh, Lucas, you were wanted to say something. Go ahead. Um, yes, so I'd like to add to what Nadia said because when I was reading the description, that was also something that spoke to me. I'll just read one of the questions that was there that kind of got me going. Uh, so you asked, uh, has globalization triggered a lack of attention to local issues or understanding of local visual languages? 
and concerns. And when I read that, uh, and this is something that I've been thinking about lately, is that I think that like the mainstream usually pushes us in like uh, towards talking about subjects that are usually like grand and understood by the whole world because this is an easier way to sell information today is like a way that everyone can understand so everyone can connect to it. And, you know, in some ways, I think that pushes us away from like local issues that maybe are just understood by like the community that lives there or by the people who have experienced uh, such a thing. But I think it's like true what Nadia said that sometimes if you speak on a very personal level that can be like understood universally. So, you know, I think dealing with like smaller subjects, which were also like pushed away from is important today for, you know, for us to just like connect in a more like community level instead of like in a global scale, which is of course like important as well. But, but I think that lately we've been like kind of pushed away from, from that direction. Okay, thank you. Um... So Juliette, uh, do you have something to add to this? We cannot hear you. Oh, is this okay? Yes, this is perfect. Okay. Uh, I said that I agree also with Nadia because uh, when I read the, this topic, I, I thought immediately about some books like autofictions autofiction novels which uh, have for origin a kind of intimacy, a personal story, but uh, the idea is to, um, is to extract what is universal in it. And uh, I think it, it the same, uh, we can do the same as photographer or artist uh, to talk about uh, a specific, specific thing, but to uh, talk about um, everyone and uh, about the question of uh, school uh, I thought that uh, uh, my studies in Louis Lumière uh, helped me to understand the nuances and to seek diversity in the production of images, but also in the way of looking at them. Uh, because uh, like many schools, we, we can like study abroad. And so the trip even close to home is like one of the best ways to see differently and to open the mind. Also because um, it's not considered as an art school. It's more like a research or technical one. So I think like uh, it makes us very free on creation. And uh, that's it, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, Nadia, how was this in your uh, education? Do you also feel that your education has prepared you to better navigate and understand the world? Or is this something you had to do for yourself or? In our department uh, in Bezalel, we had uh, a strong, um, like we talked a lot about uh, photography as a medium that we can express ourselves in and going more into an uh, art and uh, installation. Uh, lane. Myself coming more from a documentary uh, field, I uh, had a little bit of struggle over there, but uh, in the end I did find uh, a lot of useful things that uh, this kind of uh, approach to photography can uh, like uh, open my view on the world and on the uh, local uh, people and issues that I have surrounding myself. Um, I think that uh, the most significant lesson that uh, Bitsalel taught us is to create a, a feeling of community, like uh, Lucas said before, and uh, 
truly appreciate the connections that we create with fellow students and with uh, just people that we meet and photograph uh, and talk about our creation and our uh, artistic uh, practice. And uh, so how is, uh, how is Corona influencing that uh, feeling of community? Well, we, um, in some courses that we did go into the field and uh, worked with the people surrounding us, uh, like it was very important to create a connection with the subject and to truly understand where the person coming from. Uh, living in Jerusalem, which is uh, one of the uh, holiest cities, let's say, or one of the biggest cities that uh, the media also speaks about, uh, it's really easy to fall into the most uh, uh, known places and uh, known to everyone neighborhoods. I was more interested, and our department was more interested in the uh, uh, low economic uh, neighborhoods, let's say, uh, as a photography as a, a photograph subject, let's say. And uh, I was more interested in uh, just regular people that have uh, a regular life just as I am. And to hear their stories how and their uh, take on what is going on in the world, let's say. And, and even uh, coming, like making a documentary series, just uh, uh, taking pictures of what I see in the field and. I still had the, the chance to um, to make something bigger out of it and not just uh, tell the story for what it is, but kind of uh, have my own uh, take and have my own uh, voice in the presentation of the work. Uh, which is, in the big world, I think, <laughs> a good uh, habit to have, a good uh, skill to have. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, Marta, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on uh, how you relate to the educational aspect uh, of this? Sure. Um, I wrote a little bit down beforehand because I really think the school I went to in Oslo really helped shape me, but also shaped the kind of photographer I want to become, like going into the school, it all, like like you said, the, the image uh, production world is very globalized and we see images all over and it's kind of hard to navigate and know how to make a story or know how to even do a project or be creative or find creativity and find the good stories. And I really think my school kind of helped shape me and understand the the format of how things go down of how how you need to narrow things down and actually go into the very small and personal stories uh, and start there like my teacher she always she always mentioned uh, an example about cancer that I, everyone can make a cancer story and cancer is a very touchy subject and and all of that but you can make it in a cliche way or you can make it in a very personal way and you have that one person you know of who just had cancer and she's going out on her first date after having cancer kind of thing. And suddenly that's a story compared to just focusing on cancer on a big scale, because that's, that's harder to narrow down. And in, and in that aspect, she and every teacher I had kind of helped me understanding the importance of, of small people you have, have around you and how you can make stories about them and how interesting really everyone's life is if you just dig a little bit and and you find your motivation for it and it's, it's something I'm still like struggling with today finding my motivation and what what really interests me and why something interests me so having that school and really great mentors and teachers kind of shaped me in that way and I don't think I Instagram could have done that for me ever yeah okay thank you thank you so uh Gabriella I'm also curious uh going to or having had an education in South America uh, how is it for you uh, did you also uh, feel like you were prepared to navigate and understand the world better um, how was your education preparing you for this uh, yes definitely <laughs> um, because I understood 
um, new ways to to represent it to represent uh, the things that I want to tell um, in uh, different ways um, using image and the poetry in the image and with um, other uh, um, ways to tell not not as smart uh, uh, says um, in a cliche way you would have to to find a uh, new ways to to speak and try to connect with the people thank you um, so I'm also uh, wondering um, when you're working on these, in general, for all of you, uh, when you're working on these smaller topics, uh, which you all say you do, um, how do you, um, like what, what is the audience that you're thinking about? Is, do, you, do you consider an international audience or do you focus on a more uh, national or local audience to present your work? Could someone tell me something about that? Lucas? Um, yes, so I do think about audience, but I don't think I ever put it in, um, in like a, um, in like in a world, uh, audience or like a local one. I think it comes down to being more of like a general audience that can understand. Like, for example, on my last project that was on, uh, Blurring the Lines, I worked on the subject of weight. And that's like, that's a small subject that doesn't really have like a big visual representation, but everyone uh, experiences it. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. You're always like waiting for something, even if it's just like, I don't know, for an appointment and things like that. So when I think of like the audience uh, uh, dealing with like these smaller subjects is it's more about like bringing awareness to, to the topic about like, you know, something that even though everyone experiences, we don't really think about it. So, so I would say, I guess like it would be like an international audience, but more of like, you know, a, a general audience. And so everyone can kind of think about the subject. Okay, thank you. Then I'm also curious, is, is there one of you who would uh, be specifically choose to use a local national language? Um, to also reach specifically a local audience within their work, is is one of, or are you all using English or uh, a language that is more general used by an international public? Also by choosing a title or choosing an introduction for your work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, we can hear you, Julia. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think it depends on the project. Uh, for example, I worked on a project on Lebanon. So I worked with Lebanese people and the exhibition was in Paris, so in France. So um, about the uh, text, uh, I, I worked with those Lebanese people to have some Arabic translation because I thought about uh, people uh, from Lebanese, from Lebanon, for example, who, who wanted to understand both like French and Arabic language. For example, I, I think of this, but for my um, Thesis project. I I just work in French. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, would anyone like to add something about that? Yes, I wanted to to add that I definitely agree with Juliet that uh, it depends on the project uh, and. Uh, Taking myself as an example, uh, in my practice, I in my practice I work a lot with uh, elderly people, and when I work with them, uh, beginning with my grandparents, let's say, and sometimes I meet uh, random people in the park and I create a conversation with them. It's very important for me that if they have give me the permission to work with them, I take their portraits, and sometimes they let me in their houses. 
it's very important for me that the project in the, in the beginning and the photographs will, could be understandable for them so they can uh, uh, find some value in my work for themselves uh, in that sense creating a, a language for for them that still is my language as well and uh, afterwards it can grow and become uh, a more universal project uh, that could be easily translated to english and uh, could be spoken about internationally uh, but at the very beginning it's uh, important uh, to kind of create this circle of uh, conversations with a group of people or uh, a theme that I'm a field that I'm working in. Okay, thank you. I'm also curious, um, Gabriella, uh, your work is quite uh, has a, a very much activistic uh, activist feeling and uh, you are very much uh, trying to accomplish something with your work, uh, trying to create change within your work. Um, so do you also therefore choose to directly focus on a more national audience or do you prefer to, to reach an international audience to raise awareness for the national things that are happening? Uh, well, in the first time, uh, the, this project start with only one audience, it was me. And um, because it, it started being uh, like a cathartic uh, work, um, very, um, what is another? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like killer? <laughs> like healing, like, like, like healing. But yes. that was in the very beginning. But after that, I started to find like many women and girls feeling in the same, in the same way than me. So it started to be uh, to increase uh, the motivation to keep working. And I think now it's a glo I understand the problem like a global problem. Um, and everything started with, with my experience. This was not a very nice experience, definitely. But now I can think in a change and express in an other ways to tell uh, like in the photography. You ask if we feel better in our native language uh, in this kind of exercise, yes. But I'm, I'm wondering if we, with, the, with the image, we can break this um, barrier of communication. And I think that's, that's the, the magic of the photography. We, we can broke and that barrier and, and approach to that um, to that subject in a different ways. Yes, thank you. No, I uh, I think it's interesting how your project and that's what you all say uh, started from a personal uh, point of view and a personal starting point, and then uh, even without the purpose you actually found out that there is an audience out there who is in need for these stories and who are actually also asking for you to share them. Um, and therefore it, it becomes uh, automatically uh, relevant and urgent for a larger audience. So I think that's uh, very interesting to hear, uh, Gabriela. Um, I also have to say in regards to the topics you work on, the, the violent uh, women, uh, that is also something that I am less familiar with in my personal uh, environment. Um, in the, I thought in, in the Netherlands in general, and then uh, a few weeks ago, we had a, a huge um, uh, article coming out in one of the biggest newspapers here, in which um, there was a lot of um, uh, discussion uh, regarding the cultural climate in the Netherlands and how it facilitated violence against women. Um, and it immediately made me think of your project. Um, so I think it's sometimes when it's not even um, hitting me uh, right away or hitting someone else right away, uh, it can be very... Um, uh, it, it can become very worthy uh, in the long run or when you do happen uh, to, to walk into something that is very um, confronting. Um, so thank you for that. 
uh, and thank you for sharing your uh, perspective on it. Uh, so we have uh, a few questions coming in. Um, the first question is uh, recent. Uh, the question is from Steve Bisson. Um, he asks, recent years photographers are manipulating images to capture more attention, winning awards on issues very relevant. Uh, what about the ethics? Would someone like to respond on that? Well, I can, I can respond on it. Um, because I think that we all manipulate all of our pictures. I don't know exactly what degree he's referring to with manipulation, but the minute you take up a camera and you choose your frame and you choose your lens, you've chosen something in the world and not everything. And when you choose your story locally, you've chosen that kind of story. It, it's important to remember we can't tell the entire truth. Not, not any newspaper or us as photographers can tell that, but we can choose a part that could be a story to tell and that is in a way manipulating the truth like if it comes to like you know taking things out of the pictures or adding thing and twisting a story I think that's that's an ethical view that I I don't like personally but we all kind of do it no matter what though because you choose to take a picture of of that thing or that, I don't know, in a war, you take a picture of that soldier and, and in one article, it could be viewed as something that's a good thing. And in another, it could be viewed as a bad thing. And you've manipulated because you don't know the short surroundings of that soldier or what, no, you don't know what's actually going on. So it's kind of hard to talk about like manipulation in that way, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I agree. <laughs> So I think uh, I think indeed you're making choices as a photographer, uh, even uh, without um, uh, obviously um, uh, manipulating. But uh, you're choosing where you are taking a photograph. You're choosing what to put in the photograph and whatnot. Uh, so therefore, you're always manipulating um, because you're deciding and you have control and the power as a photographer to present uh, uh, what you will show and whatnot. Um, so it's interesting also to hear your ideas on that. Um, would someone else like to comment on this? I also have one other question, so we can also move forward. But if someone wants to respond on this, let me know. No? Okay. Uh, then the last question coming from Klaus. Um, so for all of you. Uh, as a young generation of emerging image makers and given the current global situation, do you think as a moral naturalist, humanist and pluralist photographer, uh, in other words, do you feel more concerned about global and social issues? Would someone like to comment on that? Um, I could go. Yes. Um, I think like global issues uh, are of course like very important, but I think that like this year, maybe I'm not alone in this. I've kind of grown tired of them because this is all we're seeing like every day is just like the state of the world and like, you know, like issues that are affecting everyone, like, the pandemic, of course. And I don't know, it, it made me grow a bit tired of them. I think uh, this was like, like maybe unconsciously, like one of the reasons I decided to to actually focus like on a smaller subject that like affects me personally. But I hope that like through that I can connect to to other people. But but at least for me, I, I can say that I, I've definitely grown tired of like uh of bigger issues and of like trying to deal with them just because I'm seeing that every day and also like experiencing, I think like we all need some form of like escapism to, you know, to deal with like what's going on right now. Yes, thank you. Add, yes, please, Nadia. I can add on that that uh, we're definitely all tired of the pandemic and uh, uh, kind of, um, it kind of reminds us the the power of photography that for what it for what it is truly for each and every one of us, 
uh, as we when we were just closed in our own spaces with ourselves we uh, I saw a lot of uh, photographers creating new works just with what we have uh, I, like it made me realize again that uh, uh, these photographs were not taken by the machines but by real people uh, speaking their own truth about and their own emotions in uh, every day while these global issues and global pandemics and political agendas are happening, we're still just uh, small people with cameras that uh, want to create and want to feel and want to share these emotions. And uh, in, kind, in that way, uh, unifying our, all of us, uh, kind of bringing us together. And so thinking about uh, large issues uh, that uh, kind of question, questioning the whole world and I'm trying really to think about uh, us little photographers that are just uh, moving our own uh, stories forward, firstly, uh, and together we create uh, solutions or just topics to, to talk about because while uh, this pandemic is happening, I think it brought up the most burning questions about photography that we always had and probably will never have the answers for. Uh, but it was just another unifying experience for uh, all of us to get back to the roots, let's say. Yes, thank you, Nadia. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we have come to the end of this panel, panel discussion. Um, I think it's very interesting what you have said, Nadia, and also uh, all of you about um, what you can do in a small national uh, impact um, to maybe raise awareness for a bigger international audience. Uh, but that uh, I think it's quite hopeful that we can all start in our own smaller communities. And if we are now, as we can see, are all spread over the world, then everyone can have an impact. Uh, and together we can raise more awareness on these very important topics that sometimes start small, uh, but have a big international influence. Um, so uh, thank you for participating and sharing your ideas. It was a great pleasure to actually see you face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, I think that's maybe also the good thing that came out of this pandemic is that I can now actually uh, see you all face-to-face, -face, even though it's digital. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I hope to all see you soon again. Uh, keep us updated on what you're doing. Uh, we will be happy to help and follow you uh, wherever you go. Uh, even though it's only in your small hometowns during this pandemic. Um, so I would like to close off for now. Uh, at five o'clock, uh, uh, we have the last panel discussion of today, uh, moderated by John Fleetwood. Um, he will be talking about the different um, elements you need as a photographer today uh, to make sure that you can still be a photographer. Uh, so stay tuned um, and join us at six o'clock, or maybe I said five. Join us at six o'clock uh, with John uh, and hope to see you all soon again. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. bye, -bye.
Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final panel for, uh, for this day of the second International Photography Conference, Blurring the Lines. For some of you, it would be good morning. For some of, it, for some of you, it would be buenos dias. For me, it's Buen uh, Noit in, uh, in Maputo. I'm speaking from Mozambique. My name is John Fleetwood. I'm the director of Photo, a platform for the promotion of photography and, and critical visual culture. I'm based in Johannesburg. Uh, but I'm currently in Maputo for uh, conducting a workshop. Uh, so I'd like to give a very big welcome to the group of participants of the workshop who are in another room. Uh, I am also very lucky to be to have been one of the curators for this year's Blurring the Lines Award. And I had the opportunity to see the most incredible work from 38 institutions of education. And for this, I uh, would really like to thank my, my colleagues uh, from Paris College of the Art, Photodoc, Nautica, for making this uh, possible. Uh, but tonight, in particular, I'd like to thank the European Cultural Centre in Venice for making this conference possible and getting us all to speak from uh, all across the world. So on tonight's panel, we are speaking about the boundary between professional and personal work. And uh, with, with us, we've got an uh, incredible panel of fantastic photographers, artists. Uh, and I hope all of you are able to, at one or other stage, go and look at their work on the Blurring Lines website. So with us is uh, Sylvie Gresko from the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague, Netherlands. Max Ahrens from the University of Applied Sciences Europe, Hamburg, in Germany. Bianca Salvo from the Universidad de los Andes, Bogota, in Colombia. Erendria Gomez Espinosa from the Centro de la Imagen in Mexico City. And Caterina Vögtel from the New York University in the United States. And then my fellow South African, Tero Makete, who is from the University of Cape Town. Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. I suppose our group is supposed to talk about uh, quite a number of things. And I, I'd like to start off by uh, just, just going through some of the, the questions that were proposed or as a way of thinking around this, this session. Uh, in a profession that requires a high degree of flexibility, of availability of time, mobility, dealing with wide ranging relationships, service communication, professional appearance and branding of artistic and professional profiles, and of your practice, network synergies, which strategies can be beneficial to a young visual maker or visual practitioner? With the advent of the digital revolution, Everyone can take pictures of everything, anytime. As a professional photographer, what is the boundary between your professional photographs and your personal ones? Travel pictures, family pictures, and so on. And I suppose I'd like to start off by making a um, separation or, or trying to, to give definition to some of these ideas that we are talking about. And that if we say that there's professional practice, on the one hand, this work that you do uh, professionally engaging with, with, with a subject and, and through your work. But then there's also personal practice, which might be projects that you work on self-motivated projects, uh, interests that you, do, that you do not see professional scope for at the moment. And then of course, there are the personal photographs, those images of travel, of family, uh, and of other, interesting possibilities. So I'd like to start off by asking questions to, to Sylvie and to, to Max. Um, I mean, is there, is, there a, is there really a distinction in these arts practices? So if we think about uh, painting or other parts, arts practices, is so little or is there a difference between professional practice and personal practice? So idea of personal work that comes in. Um, and what do you make, what makes this distinction in photography so relevant? Sylvie. Um, I think the boundaries are quite porous between uh, personal and professional. 
uh, oftentimes I find myself taking personal images uh, just on instinct and later on realizing that there was something there that intrigued me. Uh, not saying that I will use them later, but uh, for instance, I have also family images that triggered some work uh, and I made work about it. Uh, my dad was a soldier in Mozambique in the 60s. And that uh, led me to work on uh, the issue of PTSD of former soldiers, but more largely, it really pushed me to investigate uh, stories that I never heard about, or at least uh, on a very superficial level. So for me, I would say that uh, the boundary is not that uh, clear. Uh, often when we work about uh, something, it comes from a, a personal um, curiosity. And then, of course, we can make either something professional that we want to bring to the world or something that we just want to cherish in our uh, private uh, sphere. So I, I don't really um, want to separate because I think oftentimes uh, a professional work starts from a personal observation. Max? Uh, yeah, for me, um, I, I double that. Like, I'm... I'm Actively, I'm actually trying to not separate my personal work from from my professional work because I, I personally I think that it's important to develop your own style and to make it visible. And it's also a question I think to to ask yourself: uh, What do you publish and what do you make visible on social media on your website? And of course, this can also be personal work and like like iPhone photos even, if they're good enough for, for you. And um, I think it all comes down to what do you want to tell with your photos. And for me, there's like no separation between professional and personal, um, as long as it fits to what you want to represent of yourself. Bianca, Erindria, I'd like to ask you the next question. Um, so we started off talking about that uh, that it's porous between professional and and and personal work, and for me it's it's quite interesting because uh, many of you uh, might might have been wearing masks lately, and so we have learned to to carry this membrane between us and the rest of the world, and perhaps photography is also such a membrane that allows certain things to travel through, um, but also resist other things. And I'm, so one, I'm, and I'm so wondering, during COVID, how, how did your work start to develop? Was it more clear what is personal work, or personal practice, and what is professional practice? Was there more or less of a, of a poorer situation? Bianca. Well, I, I think I share the same same position of Sylvia and Max. I, I, I don't use like to, to um, separate what is professional and what is personal. And also because I think I had like I was quite lucky that uh, um, even being able to transform personal interests and converted them in professional work. So uh, I, I, I try to, to not make this binary and this, uh, this categorization of, of making photography that, that's strong in my practice. And I, I like to think about my practice and, and my, my work as a combination of personal motivation that, that go into professional uh, intents and intention, yes, intentions. Okay, for me, uh, I see my personal work as a part of a process of um, experimentation. I experimented a lot and more in this quarantine, it, um, I was able to, to do that and I'm also uh, seeing that ex uh, personal work and um, professional, it's the same. Even though sometimes in professional work that is paid and there's a deadline, it's uh, really hard for me to have this amount of experimentation. Uh, but it's also really good for me to have this challenge. It's, it's really rich for my 
my work have challenge of the lines or time, a particular time to experiment it, some kind of materials. I work with honey and other material, materials and I need really certain of time. And this quarantine, I was able to experiment it a lot. Right. So Katerina and, and Thero, I, I'd like to, to move over to you now because I'm wondering what is the global understanding of this idea of the non-binary that we would all want to have. We would all want to be photographers that do personal work or projects that are self-motivated, that becomes, um, we all would like to be, to, to do work that is at the core of our practice. Um, but when we do professional work, often it might not necessarily be in the same industry. For many of us living in different parts of the world, one cannot physically make a living out of personal work. There's no market, there's no gallery system of support. And so one of the things that then starts to, to happen is that there, there is a separation of professional and, and, uh, and personal work. And at various times, these come together. But maybe you, you just want to give us a, as an understanding of, of how it works, perhaps in your different spaces and how you see it. I mean, I would imagine in New York, there's, uh, there's so many opportunities. Uh, there are in, in South Africa, perhaps those are different. Katerina. I'm sorry, the internet just cut out for a second there. Um, was the question about the difference between the binary and different areas of of the globe? I I I we we was we were speaking about the idea that uh, the world or a global understanding of how we see uh, this manifestation of personal and uh, professional work is not the same, and that in many spaces it's quite hard to use your personal. Uh, work or work that that you created as uh, self-motivated work mm -hmm. to be able to distribute that and and get the world to see it. And I was I was I was interested in the, in the fact that you're in New York, where that is uh, one would assume that there are so many opportunities to to get this out. And I was wondering how that can set off perhaps differences to other places where it's not so easy to show your work or get opportunities to, to develop your personal work? Yeah, definitely. I'm actually uh, based in Spain now, but I had been living in New York uh, for years. Um, and I think there is, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe a bit more of an opportunity to combine the two or to, to make, to cross over personal into a professional sense. Um, I think it's also not necessarily a concept like in New York, you're very much used to um, having that idea of, of the two of there being kind of a professional side and a personal side. And I don't think it necessarily has to be divided into those two discrete um, kind of kind of worlds. I think that that's a bit arbitrary and maybe a bit of an easy way, easier way of thinking about the two, but I don't think those necessarily um, have to be kind of these two discrete things, even though that is very much the common way of thinking about it in New York or here in Spain. Good. Um, to begin, I have to make a quick correction from the introduction. I'm actually not from South Africa, I'm from Botswana. Oh, uh, I was under the impression that you're South African. No, no, no. I'm, I'm from Botswana, but my mother's side of the family is from South Africa, and that influences my work and what I did for, what I entered for the Blowing the Ryans competition. So me being from Botswana, actually, um, I grew up without there being that much of an art industry um, where you can exhibit um, work um, in a gallery, per se. Um, and I had uh, an economically privileged life such that I was able to go to UCT, being funded by my parents and 
Um, since then, I've been lucky to get opportunities such as um, blurring the lines and such and that that have broadened my my network. Such that at this point, I've been in a position where I've been lucky enough to only have to produce my personal work, work that I want to do, and comes from um, what's in my head, as opposed to somebody, as opposed to making work to survive. I would say, and that is something that I see happening a lot in South Africa and especially where I'm from in Botswana, whereby um, there's not even really an, an art institution per se where you can study photography if you want to be a fine art photographer um, or really a place where you can learn photography, to be honest, um, like Market Photo Workshop in Johannesburg, for example. Um, so, yeah, I've, I, I do see... Um, that distinction where I have colleagues, friends um, who didn't go to university, who didn't have the same opportunities that I did, who are making work to survive and build themselves up in that way where I went to an institution and I was lucky that um, there's always briefs for competitions being sent your way. And I had a graduate exhibition, which a lot of people attended last year. And you know, so it was it was much easier for me to to transition from um, being in university and having to stand on my own two feet afterwards. All right. So so let's start a chat a little bit more about kind of personal photographs and how you circulate them. Uh, in the previous panel, uh, just started to touch on on this idea that when we when we create personal work, uh, it's also distributed, and sometimes it's distributed in the same platforms than where we would distribute our professional work. I'm quite interested in understanding how you see that working. What happens to start, what happens when there's a clear, kind of blurring of lines of your professional work and your, and your personal work? Uh, do you guys post, for instance, on social media, both on the same account? Do you separate them? Um, how, do you operate, how do you operate with that? And maybe we can start this time with uh, Erendria and, and uh, Katarina. I operate uh, a little bit my social media. I really um, prefer to share my work in galleries or in on my page way. Sometimes I put some of my work there, but because it's really material, I I prefer the presence of of people that it's not possible in this quarantine, and I'm suffering a lot because of that. But I'm waiting to share my work really soon. And and so so in particular, what I'm interested in is uh, personal work. So do you do you ever post any photographs of you going around traveling? Or do you see social media only as a professional uh, kind of market space? Okay, I, I I don't share a lot of my personal photograph. I see a media as I share my professional work, like personal and professional, but talking about art and my photograph. Yes, I I see like a window to to share some of my work, and, but not a lot. Katerina. Uh, it's something I've definitely thought a lot about the kind of blurring of those lines, but less so much in terms of um, maybe personal and professional images on social media, and a lot more in the sense of, of family photographs and making work that has to do, professional work that has to do you know, with my family versus, you know, just a family snapshot and um, how those two kind of combine because there's definitely a bit more of like an intentionality or kind of a forward facing directionality of the work, you know, when it's in more of a, you know, professional context than just a, a family photo, a family snapshot. Um, but at the same time, there are just, you know, casual family photos taken that work their way into kind of more of a of a concrete series uh, sort of thing. And then, of course, uh, with the way that those are presented, both in physical and virtual, 
or I don't know, gallery spaces versus uh, social media. It all in the end kind of mixes together. Um, but I think, I think in terms of blurring the lines, it always works kind of maybe both ways, like the personal influencing on the, the professional when you put it into a social media context and then also in kind of the family photo uh, sense of, sense of the, the word too. Right, so, so Sylvie uh, and Bianca, I, I mean, you guys are now at this cusp, right? So you are now at the end of your, or close to the end of your student years and the start of your working years. And um, I'm wondering what happens then when you start to think about your practice on social media. Is there a shift? Is there a shift from being a student to be a professional? Uh, are there kind of very clear messages that you start uh, thinking about what you want to share and distribute on the internet that you wouldn't have done when you were a student? Of course, you're also growing up, like all of us. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a question there, like, do, do, you, do you start to think differently about social media and how you distribute personal images? Bianca, do you want me to? Uh, it's, it's fine for me. I, I can start or you can go. <laughs> um, well, uh, I have to say that I don't have like this kind of good relationship with social media. Uh, and when it start to talk about Instagram and Facebook, I'm actually very shy to public and share my work. Uh, so I wanted to post more, but then I, I always uh, find myself like just not doing it. Uh, so I don't know if, if um, surely um, uh, shifting from a student position to a professional position, uh, it requires you to think much more about how you promote your work and how you publish your work. I think Instagram, uh, for example, is a very good instrument to promote and, and, and get like the get like some kind of recognition of, of what you're doing. But it's not the only platform. I think that like digital revolution somehow is not just about like the evolution of the medium of photography, but also uh, sometimes I'm very fascinated how opportunities uh, are uh, traveling like around the world. So I think that this is probably uh, what I use the most as, as a medium to promote my work and to share my and sharing my work. Um, for me, I would say, um, I'm not really good with social media. So I would say that I'm not the person that <laughs> uh, can answer this question properly. Uh, in the sense that for me, social media has always been something that I saw as a good tool to share and maybe to get to know other people that I wouldn't talk to um, in my normal life. Um, so I kept it like posting on feeling. It's kind of a diary of course. Um, the only thing, I have some boundaries. I avoid sharing things that are really, really, really intimate. Like uh, if I go to a dinner, I will obviously not share this kind of things. Uh, it's not a food uh, contest either. Um, and when it comes to my own work, I'd like to think that for really like the professional work, there is a website for that. And I'd like to keep it there. And my Instagram is just like who I am. Uh, my moods, what I see, uh, my thoughts, things for later also, things that I spot, also shedding light uh, on things that are happening in my professional life. Um, but now, of course, working on this topic of the lithium, I've been uh, starting to consider my use of Instagram and also really reducing um, what I post because obviously Instagram, iPhones, uh, the computer we are talking in, are part of this uh, bigger problem that is right now affecting a place really dear to me. Uh, since I'm working on the lithium mining in Portugal, where my family comes from, um, so yeah, I'm I'm becoming more and more concerned uh, with the use of this. Also, because I think there are many other opportunities out there. It takes a lot of time and energy and patience, but I think it's worth taking time when you care about something. Thank you. All right, so, so Max, I, I, I wanted to, to ask around the possibility of meaning making on social media. 
and how the branding of your professional work uh, may shift because of uh, other photographs that you that you might brand your personal life with. I mean, is there intersection where these things uh, shift so much that it actually could potentially change the meaning of your work? Um, yes, I I think um, with your Instagram or general social media um, channels, oh, actually, it's a problem now. Oh, no. Sorry. I, I can hear you. And I, I think it brings the opp opportunity to gain more control about um, about how you present your work. And so I, I think that um, I, I don't publish private photos, but personal work and professional work. And so the in the way you, you choose your, or you curate your, your feed on Instagram, for example, you gain more control in, um, in yeah, bringing exposure to your work. And if, if, for example, you use another medium, like you mentioned, um, that Instagram into, introduces just like um, stories a couple of years ago, then of course I jump on it or I try to, I'm not really good with Instagram, but I try to. <laughs> And um, then you can use this, for example, for behind the scenes. So people are getting more interested into your work. And I think that's very important to be up to date. Um, yeah, I think the way I use social media specifically, like my Instagram is, it's predominantly um, my professional work, as in like artwork, photo photography. Um, and then in between, there is a bit of my personal life, like if I'm traveling or if I go somewhere, um, because I sort of feel that that gives it a personality as well. Um, when somebody comes and sees your feed, because I think social media, I mean, Instagram itself as a platform isn't itself designed for artwork or photographers. Like if somebody leaves my profile and it's just artwork, they're going to go and see a meme or something else and a dog running over something, you know what I mean? So I don't take it that seriously in terms of um, thinking that I have to only post professional work on here. I think it, it, it gives somebody an insight into like, you know, oh, he's traveled here or he's doing this or this is what he's into. He likes doing other things apart from, from artwork because that's what social media primarily is for me. And then if people do want to see my professional work, they go and see um, my website portfolio and how I present things there. And then I think another thing that I want to say is that, um, I mean, in terms of this discussion so far, is that like, I have a lot of friends, again, like being from Botswana who aren't artists and they work in like the corporate world, for example. So if I'm in a WhatsApp group with them, they're always sharing their LinkedIn and things like that. So I don't think Instagram is like the artist's LinkedIn where like, you know, this is where you go to find artists, I think, because it is a cluster of just any type of visual information. Um, so I, so I, I keep my Instagram both personal and um, professional. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to move over to some questions that come from, from, uh, from the rest of the panel. So there's a question from uh, Berenice Freitag, um, or it's actually a question from the public. Uh, is it possible to live from your personal work only, artworks at galleries and so on? Or do the artists uh, have to do a job? Uh, sorry. Or is the artist as a job uh, is something dying in our times? So I suppose the, the, the, the real question is, can you live from your personal work, selling artworks at galleries? Is it possible? Anybody? Like, yes, I would... Bianca. Oh, sorry. I hope it will be possible. I mean, I think um, from my personal experience, I mean, I, I completely understand the question because uh, earning a living with a personal project, uh, uh, especially in the field of photography, is not that easy. Uh, I think there's a lot of possibility in terms of fundings and an and institution that can actually give you some money to develop personal project. Uh, but surely, uh, well, I, I think you, you should always have like a, a, a plan B. For example, in my case, I, I, 
I decided to dedicate myself also to um, to teaching photography. Uh, and uh, I think the academy and the university is like actually the, the perfect environment in which I can go on developing my practice, my practice as an artist and my practice as an, an art educator. Hi, um, I just want to say that I think it's it's possible, but it's um, it's become it's probably become very hard to to live off uh, your personal work as an artist. And um, like uh, like Bianca already said, I think there are a lot of possibilities these days that can fund your work even even for weeks, but it's still very hard. And so I think you have to stay flexible um, as an artist. May, may I ask, what, what are the other opportunities uh, in this flexibility? So if you, if you can't make a living from being an artist, what are the other options? For me, um, I'm, I'm working as a freelance photographer. So um, at the moment, I'm working for a German magazine as a photographer. And um, I, I always liked working as a freelance photographer just as much as I like working as an artist for personal work. And I, for me, that's a good way to combine like the personal work and the professional work because I want to make them, ideally they would be speaking the same language. So that's not something I try to separate. It's actually something I try to combine more. So that being, even uh, magazines try to book me as an artist rather than just someone who takes the photo they want to take, be taken. Maybe to give some kind of uh, uh, reference, if we if we think about South Africa, who has uh, which has a very strong history of developing photography, there's about four or five photographers that uh, can make a living out of the sales of their artworks in the country. The rest of the people have to find other ways. And often this is education, uh, commercial photography. And uh, yeah, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of interested uh, in, in uh, Erendria in, in Mexico. What are the possibilities to live from your photography and in, in from, from sales of art? Mm, there's a scholarship or there's a, a few of them. Mm, and also there's a precarization of work that could make uh, really hard to develop a personal and professional work. But sometimes I see like a miracles when personal works come up or, or other works from my, from my um, friends. And it's really hard to, to combine personal and professional work because of these precarizations, um, because of the scholarships are really a few and there's no for everyone, but there's an, a few opportunities to, to live and to develop work or personal work in Mexico. I don't know, it's, it's really hard to work Mm, like an artist and also mm, sometimes we we need to to work in in others in other parts to be able to develop our our personal work i don't know <laughs> All right okay so i'm i'm going to read uh, a question from from steve steve Bisson. um he says, I have a question. Today, in different panels, we heard from different graduates uh, their will to contribute to relevant issues in society, politics, violence, gender, race. How do they match this ethical position with both personal and professional work? I think it's a really important question. It's this question, do you think there are ethical shifts when you do professional work or personal work? Anybody? I all the time I'm thinking about uh, representation and the, the importance of the representation of the other and I also I start to represent too much the other one is is the reason I think I like more personal work and 
work with myself instead of the representation because I, I have some problems with that. And I think I have a lot of respect for those who who that with a ethical or really ethical work in representation of other persons because it is really important for me. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, so when, when work starts as personal work, and at the moment that you start uh, putting this together, there's a kind of parameter of, of ethics that, that is quite different to when, uh, to once this work starts to develop into something else and become more public, for instance. Um, have any of you had experiences in, in that? Um, I have, um, in my third year, I did a project about um, a fighter jet pilot who, who passed away. And I wanted to make sort of like a, a memorial book towards him um, because I knew it's kind of like the news media cycle was going to go by so quickly. So I made the, the, the artwork before con like talking to the family themselves, even though I didn't use any visual representation of what the fighter jet pilot looked like. Um, and then I showed it in my exam and then a few other people saw it. Um, but I knew that I wanted to go back to that family and give them the, the, the, the, a copy of the book as an artwork. Um, and they were very sort of like, you know, not receptive towards it. They were, you know, because I was cheap, talking about something that was very personal to them. It existed in the public in terms of, I saw it in the newspaper and he made a sacrifice in terms of like, he could have chose to um, crash into like a, a nearby building, like just eject and then the, the plane crashes into like a nearby building killing people or um, he, um, like crashing it himself and like just taking his life um, and saving other people. Um, so that was my first experience of sort of, <sighs> making something about someone and with good intentions and then sort of like some of the, the main people you are doing it for not being receptive towards it or not understanding what you're doing and that patience as well that it takes time for people um, who don't understand artwork sometimes for it to, to process as well especially when you're dealing with a heavy subject such as um, a tragedy like death. Mm -hmm. Good point. Bianca. Yes, I wanted to add something that I think the question, the, the, the topic of the ethic uh, in, in the development of a personal project is, is kind of important and, and but sometimes complicated. For example, during the development of my graduation project, the contact zone that is the same one that I that I applied with the blurring the lines uh, was uh, it, it rise up some like polemics or, or, or questioning uh, from the public because uh, especially for these things of the ethic and for, um, for, for the aspect that uh, uh, many people question the fact that I was uh, working and talking about a topic such as colonization from a privileged point of view. So I think it's very important like to stress problematic as like uh, ethical aspect of a project and I always when when I'm working on a new project I always question myself about the ethics whether if my images that I'm producing and I'm I'm proposing to the public that appropriate or not and, and especially I always question myself is I'm if I'm proposing images that somehow they are kind of um, created from a privileged point of view on certain uh, topics or specific topic that can have like a political or social relevance. Great, thank you. I think I think we're going to cut it there. Tomorrow is a long day with a, with another program. So uh, I'd like to start to thank the panelists. Uh, thank you very much for your for your contributions. Um, as uh, many of you would know, these discussions will be available later. So from next week onwards. They will be available as videos on uh, on YouTube, um, but uh, the discussion continues tomorrow, and I hope that everybody will join us uh, at 9:45. It starts at 2:30. Uh,
they will be the uh, launch of the of the book. Uh, very impressive book so far that I've seen virtually. Um, and I'm really hoping that all of you would uh, have a great day of, of more discussion. Um, and thank you again very, very much to the panelists uh, for, for, all, for all of you sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you.